States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, I'm going to read now the notice of appeal process. This is the appeal to appeal a decision from the Metropolitan Transportation Licensing Commission if anyone feels that they have received an adverse decision and wish to appeal. Pursuant to the provisions of Section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, notice is hereby given that if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Metropolitan Transportation Licensing Commission, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of certiorari with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Metropolitan Transportation Licensing Commission's decision. We advise that you seek your own legal, independent legal advice to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met. Have members of the commission had an opportunity to review the minutes from the March 28, 2019 meeting? They are yet. Have not. Well, that may be a first. It, it may be. <laughs> Way to put yeah. I'm happy to quickly look through them. I don't remember anything. Um... Also, I would like to welcome Carrie Rogers, a new member to the commission. And Mr. Rogers, I assume you have not had a chance to read the minutes either, have you? <laughs> so there's only two of us that have read them out of the four right now. Um, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to hold the approval of the minutes in abeyance till we have uh, an opportunity for everyone to review them who actually attended the March 28th meeting, okay? <laughs> All right. And we're now going to start on the public hearings. And Mr. Fields, uh, if you would help enlighten us on... The one, two, three, four, five, six different things. Uh, I guess we'll start at the top. Okay. Uh, the first one is consideration of operation zone restriction for pedal carriages uh, or pedal vehicles. The um, uh, 6.75410 uh, allows the uh, uh, Transportation Licensing Commission or its staff to establish operating zones for the pedal vehicles, both carriages and pedicabs. Um, and we had had uh, an issue that had been had been raised, uh, uh, frankly, in one of the neighborhoods that uh, we spent a great deal of time on. Uh, ended up being a, a pedal carriage that was not uh, licensed, and we were able to find it, and it's we're working through with that. But uh, Council Lady uh, Berkeley Allen had uh, expressed some concerns and issues, and wanted to make a presentation. So. Uh, we, as, as always, when the Metropolitan Council asks the Commission to consider something, and especially if they'd like to consider something in person, we've uh, established a public hearing for you to consider uh, to consider what she's brought forward. She has, I know for sure she's met with all the industry, because I met with them as well. We had a very good meeting. I think they actually have uh, some consensus on what makes sense for the uh, pedal carriages and pedicabs to operate. So. Uh, if you would have a public hearing, I'd, I would call on her uh, to be able to comment. And uh, Councilman Withers is also here. I think he would like to comment as well. Well, let's open up the public hearing here for the first council person. And we now have our chairperson back. I was. Hey, how are you doing? We'll just turn it cell phone. There it is. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to do this. Billy Fields was um, kind enough to set up a good meeting uh, between the pedal ca carriage operators um, and uh, him and me, and we had a good conversation about where they are currently operating. It is actually a, a fairly small area. Um, when I was looking through the regulations to respond to constituents who were emailing me saying they had seen uh, a pedal carriage in 12 South and, and was that okay, when I went to look in the in the regulations, I realized that that the the boundaries that I had seen and been talking about specifically refer only to the low speed vehicles, which is the golf carts, and that pedal carriages are in another paragraph, and so we do not have any boundaries currently defined for them. Um, and in having the discussion, it, it turns out that just because of the physical limitations of how far you can pedal, they do operate in a in a much smaller area 
within uh, the larger boundary that's already defined for the low speed vehicles. So we um, took the area where they operate and took into account the fact that sometimes they have to deviate because of uh, road closures, which does happen in Nashville from time to time, and um, drew up uh, a map and I will hand this to Mr. Fields to pass out to people. I will say this is this is probably the final boundary, but I, I would um, welcome a little bit of discussion about that before we, we totally define that. So if you are familiar with the other map that is um, for the low speed vehicles, it extends to the other side of, of the river and, and farther out um, into parts of Germantown and East Nashville. But physically, this is about as far as you go if you start downtown. Um, and part of what this does, I think, is precludes the possibility of a new operator coming into town and deciding they would like to set up in one of the small commercial districts that abut residential neighborhoods, which we feel like would not be appropriate. Um, this is where the tourists are. This is what makes sense. All the carriage operators have agreed that um, given their years of experience, they know good and well this is where they belong. But somebody new coming to town may not know that and may just come and ask, and if we don't have a reason to say no, then we would might say yes. Um, so I would I would request um, that y'all look at the boundaries that we've established here um, and approve these or something similar to them. There's there's some neighbors and some operators who may also speak as well. There you'll notice there's kind of one area that looks a little bit like spaghetti down at the bottom with several different options. All we're asking to do is to define the the outer boundary and they could travel within their. Um, on whatever streets make sense given the current road closings and hills and things like that. Um, the one uh, issue of discussion um, is the southern boundary, whether it makes sense to stop that at Grand or to go all the way down to Edge Hill. There is one operator who currently does a route um, that, that goes a little bit farther south. Um, it uh, abuts, under some circumstances, Garrett Bennett, which is a retreat center. So I would request, and Mr. Fields, you can guide me on the language of this, that 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 part of the route be declared a quiet zone um, with the possibility of enforcement, I hope, um, because if someone's, you know, they're contemplating the meaning of life, it would be better not to have um, what is sometimes raucous behavior wheeling, wheeling past them. So that, that one particular area is one you may want to discuss different ways to, to treat that. If, you, if it is included in the map, that area south of Grand that goes down to Edge Hill, then I would request that it be designated as a quiet zone. Um, and I will take questions and then um, step back and let other neighbors and, and the operators speak. So if y'all have any questions for me, let me know. In your discussions with the operators or the owners of the pedal tavern the vehicles, were they suggesting that they might be able to enforce that quiet zone? That is an excellent question. Um, and I will turn to Mr. Fields well, to start I with could, that question. Comment. We, we've had, when we initially started, I think all the operators would agree that we had some issues specifically in, uh, in and around the Pinnacle downtown. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and it was, it, were, it was basically complaints every day. I mean, it just, if it wasn't every day, it was every other day. After many conversations and a great deal of work uh, on the part of the operators, those complaints have basically disappeared. Now, I'm not going to say they won't come back tomorrow. I'm just saying they've disappeared. Well, what we were we were talking. What I think we'll do. The law is, is is basically moot when it comes to the quiet zones, specifically in this ordinance. However, I think you could. There are ways for us to uh, through conditional use or conditional provisional approval of. What I was saying is that you could um, allow the um, operating area to extend beyond that. Um, the, or beyond Grand, past the Scared Bennett Center, conditional on the operators um, conforming to certain requirements, such as not making too much noise or allowing their passengers to make too much noise. And if if that condition is not complied with, then you can just simply revise the operating zone to not include that area. Counselor, as you know and I know, what's quiet for one person is noisy for another, and what's noisy for another might not be offensive to to the third person. I frankly I think if you're gonna extend this down there with an understanding this is gonna be a quiet zone, it's gonna to have to be voluntary on the on the part of the operators and the people who are actually sitting there moderating the uh, or you know sitting on the on the vehicle with the people. 
but they may understand that you and actually staff as well have the authority to revise the operating area at any time. But the only way we hear of anything is when a complaint's made, then we're back here. What I want to do is avoid there being a complaint. Well, if, if the experience, uh, if it were extended to Grant, if the experience is the same as what we've had downtown, I think we will have cooperation based on history the last two or three years. Okay. And I would just, I appreciate that question. Is the language, or again, if I can work with the, the lawyer in the room, on the, on the language to include what you just said in, in a way that, that um, makes it clear that a revision would be um, a consequence of repeated offenses or? I mean, I think it just depends how the motion is worded. So if they were to word the motion in such a way as to say, you know, describe the operating area and then describe that portion of the operating area being included subject to a condition that, and then prescribe the condition. Candidly, I think the sanction that would be imposed would have to depend on the, a, the complaint if one came forward because you may have several operators in that zone eventually and one person violates the ordinance. They need to work together on this. Yes, mm -hmm. and so that's why I'm saying it needs to be voluntary by the companies enforcing it among each other so no one loses, so. I think that's a good plan. Um, and then I would, would note that there are already established quiet zones within this area, um, and I don't know, I would just wanna make sure that establishing this boundary doesn't um, void any of that, so again. That was gonna be my question. Our quiet zone, in terms of this ordinance, it does not specifically address any quiet zones. What we've been able to do through, through, through basically the, the office and working with, commit with the individual carriages, in this particular case, the, the director has authority to limit the, where carriages can operate or that the pedal carriage can operate. For instance, it, it, when you pass, now I would, I would not do anything beyond, normally when I either, when I change something that you've done that I have authority over, what would happen is I would report it back. But if there were to be problems with this particular issue, we'd come back to the commission and say, this is what I've done. I've put a temporary stop to this particular area, and then I would ask you to confirm it. So does that mean there are none presently? There, again, downtown, there, there are, there, there's a noise ordinance that protects us downtown. And, and that is, you, well, that, that's in effect downtown. There are some enforcement issues, but again, what we've the experience that we've had the last couple of years has been working directly with the companies, explaining where the problems are, and in and, and many cases having evidence from, from citizens out windows and such, uh, and they have been corrected for the most part. I'm not gonna say there's never allowed, uh, I think they're called the woo girls. The Is woo woo, the, woo woo, the, the woo woo. Double and, woo. Uh, there's two. Uh, two woos. I understand. But uh, again, we've not, that has become a relatively quiet issue for us and we'll hope it stays that way. Yes, sir. You got a nice boundary going in the exterior here and everything and then down on the south side, just a little north of that quiet, proposed quiet zone, there's lots of blue lines all right. inter, inter So some of that was just offering uh, to the operators different options for them to choose. And I, mm -hmm. I would say no one, no one has said, well, um, this one's better than the other. So I would, I would, I would um, go with the outer one. The outer one? I mean, the, yeah, the main, the main thing was just to get beyond the residential areas. I thought you were carving up the city for the No, <laughs> I am not carving up the city. So again, we had someone who was better at drawing maps, but this was the, late, the latest version, so we can clean that up and give that to Mr. Fields. Um, but I would say what, what I have here, minus the spaghetti in the, in the middle. Thank you so much, I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Councilman, if you'd like to. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, I'm Brett Withers, I represent District 6 on the Metro Council, which is East Nashville. Um, I greatly appreciate Councilmember Allen bringing forward this issue, um, and, and especially with her willingness to work with the operators to come up with some boundaries. At the present time, this map does not include uh, pedal taverns coming across the bridges into East Nashville. Um, traffic congestion it can be quite high on, on those bridges, and I, from, a, from that standpoint, the traffic management is a little bit of a concern, um, but also, um, Five Points and some other neighborhoods in East Nashville and other parts of town 
are becoming their own tourist destinations um, in addition to being primarily residential areas with some businesses nearby. So uh, I support the work that Councilman Brown has done to sort of limit uh, this activity, this particular activity to the downtown area, at least for now. Um, what, I, what I would be willing to consider, and it's my understanding that it remains a possibility, is that if there were a special event, we have things going on at Nissan Stadium or, or some other kind of a, like a festival event, if, uh, I'm amenable to allowing different kinds of operators to have a permit in conjunction with a special event. I think it's conceivable to me at the, some point in time that could make sense. Uh, but I would uh, encourage the uh, commission to limit that to a special event that has its own permit, usually that has a street closure permit as well as traffic uh, mitigation requirements. So I, I think that that enables some degree of this kind of commercial enterprise to support neighborhood festivals in particular in some of these areas, but not to have this be uh, a day-to-day -day, uh, occurrence in, in primarily residential areas. So I support the efforts of Councilmember Allen, appreciate the work of the operators to uh, come to some agreements and uh, urge approval by the commission. Thank you. Ms. Fields. The operators are here. If, you, if, if any, obviously it's a public hearing, they could speak. In my conversations with them, they are in agreement with the need to with, with with a map such as this but again they're present if they'd like to speak so i have no problem with trying to figure out what an outer boundary would be um what i hear everyone saying is oh they belong downtown forgetting about the i don't know how many thousands of residents live downtown and i will disagree Respectfully, Mr. Fields, with your comment that the problems have stopped downtown. Um, I have an email box full. The reported ones to me, I should have said. Okay, <laughs> that's fair. I have an email box full, not only today, but several times a week of complaints about these things. They are disruptive, they block traffic, they stop in the middle of the street, kids get off, they're vomiting on the sidewalks where people are walking their dogs. It's a mess, and the the companies, from my perspective, in my opinion, do not enforce you know any kind of responsible behavior on these things. So, if we're going to start talking about quiet zones, and quiet zones belong you know over here by Scarab Bennett or over here in East Nashville, then we need to be thinking a little more broadly about the people who actually live downtown. And I, I may be the only one on the commission that lives downtown. I don't know, but. Um, you know, talk about wanting to contemplate your life. I mean, we got people trying to work. We got people trying to carry on careers, offices in their homes. We got nurses, ER nurses who are saying to me, you know, I can't get any sleep. They're going up and down, just up and down Third Avenue like crazy, right around Third and Demumbrian, around, you know, KVB is fine. I don't, and you may say, well, it's, you know, it's Broadway, you know, we're two blocks from Broadway. Well, I don't hear anything from Broadway other than when, you know, Nudie's starts acting up or Kid Rock starts acting up or they get into a battle of the, you know, who can be the loudest. We don't hear anything from Broadway, but we do hear this constant, you know, woo-woos and, like I said, people getting off and gathering outside of the building and under people's patios and screaming and yelling and vomiting and getting sick and, you know, it's a nightmare. So I don't support... You know, if we're going to talk about quiet zones, we need to talk about downtown. And this is a long overdue conversation. So anybody from the companies who wants to comment on that, I'd love to hear it. I'm the owner of Sprocket Rocket. Um, and I just wanted to respond to your comments uh, respectfully. Um, and uh, if I could disagree with some of them respectfully. Um, we as, we're not the only people downtown. There are more party buses, more party tractors and party barges than there are um, pedal taverns. Oh, and and <laughs> sure. Um, I lived in the Encore for three years. And so not only did I live downtown, but I also 
live and breathe downtown. Um, our job is to be downtown. Our job is to manage our companies. Um, our job is to manage our employees. Um, we in absolutely no way allow people to jump on our bikes. We in no way allow people to jump off. As a matter of fact, if you were at our uh, bikes and you heard our speeches and our rules beforehand, you would hear that we have very strict rules. Um, this is not something that I'm making up right now. We've been operating for four years. And I would invite you to come and visit our facility, visit our bikes, um, listen to our staff, listen to how they give their speeches, listen to how strict we are. Um, we are actually, in fact, uh, if you want to uh, sort of compare us to the other party vehicles out there, we're the only ones who don't allow, um, how can I say this, straws of certain shapes. We don't allow blow-ups of certain shapes in any way, shape, or form, or as uh, the, the, the unregulated vehicles do. Um, I would invite you to spend any weekend down there observing vehicles and see which ones have these things and which ones don't. Um, when I lived at 1702-301 uh, 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 at the Encore, um, I heard Broadway all night long. I hear everything all night long. So I just, wanted, I just want there to be a fair picture. I don't, I don't feel like that was a fair um, depiction of us. Um, we're not the wild, wild west. We spent a lot of years um, working really hard to do this the right way. Uh, these companies, Pedal Tavern and myself, we have a lot invested in these. We have no interest in being a bad neighbor. We have no interest in having liabilities where people are jumping on our bikes and jumping off. Um, the amount of stress that my staff has because of the rules that I have in place, it, it's, it's rough on them because they're under so much pressure to do the right thing. They're under so much pressure to not let people stand up, not let people drink too much. We have a lot of rules and I, would just hope that you guys would take the time to understand how much work that we put into doing the right thing, being good neighbors. Uh, we are employers. We're small businesses. I have over 60 people on staff. They're all local. They all make their living from this. They all pay taxes. I pay a ton of taxes. Pedal Tavern pays a ton of taxes. Pedal Tavern employs a lot of people. We're in Nashville and we're regulated by you guys. And there's a lot of companies out there that are not regulated, that are, are doing whatever they want. We don't allow music with explicit words. I would just invite you to come out and check us out. And I just would like there to be a, a fair view of who we actually are. That's all, thank you. Or if you have any questions. Well, I appreciate those comments and they're, um, they are fair. Um, the, I can't, specifically pull up an image in my mind at this moment of a spro uh, sprocket rocket that's you yes sprocket rocket. Um, doing that most of what I see are the actual pedal taverns with the people jumping off and uh, taking pictures and they're you know all the stuff I said um, so if anyone hears in the room from them that'd be great to hear from you but you know people who live downtown as you know are, are paying taxes too and they are trying to carry on with their lives. And yes, I get it, we live in Nashville, but um, I, you know, we don't have, I, I don't think anyone has a problem with the you know, concept. Um, but my point is if we're talking about limitations and everyone's gonna say, well, we need to you know, put a quiet zone here or there, uh, we need to think about doing that in a fair way. Um, I would love to, and probably will, at your kind invitation, come and check it out. I think it, I, I appreciate that. I think it's great. Um, somebody mentioned all this, you know, were you guys working cooperatively? So why are there, I mean, have you guys amongst yourselves coordinated to say, listen, here are the rules we have. You know, hey, listen, we don't allow this, we don't allow that. Like, do you, is there any kind of collaboration on that with the other companies? Or do they so, all just do whatever they want? Which so is just what to, it seems like. Just so you understand how all this is set up. The company, National Pedal Tavern, is Angie and Brian over there. They own that term, Pedal Tavern. 
public refers to all of us as Pedal Taverns. My brand name is called Sprocket Rocket, but we are the same concept. We are a 15, 16 passenger pedal vehicle. Okay. Um, the, the, when you slice us up between party bikes, pedal taverns, which is us to you, in the transportainment um, field, if you will, you have the party barges, which is the, um, looks like a swimming pool in a limo. Okay, I'm just trying to. No, I, I get it. Okay, so you have the tractors, and then you have the party buses, and those collectively that are not regulated, that have no rules, they have no self-imposed rules, they don't, they don't, they have no rules. And you, but if, if I have anything to say about it, they're going to have rules pretty soon. Sure. So I just want to talk just because you're here, and I want to talk comparatively because I'm going to have this same discussion with them at some point in okay. the near future. Um, I just, you know, kind of want to want to know what you all are willing to do in terms, I mean, are you not willing to say we won't go down Third Avenue between DeMombreed and KVB? Or, you know, well, nobody's what? Nobody's saying we're not willing to do anything. That, okay. I didn't know that that was the discussion here. The, the discussion that we had before this was, was about boundaries, so that's what we talked about. Okay. We've been in, in front of this committee for four years now doing these kinds of things. There is not one time where any of us has sat up here and said, well, we're not going to do anything, because okay. we can't do that. So what I would like is for there to be a better understanding of us and how we operate and that I don't think it's fair with all due respect to paint this picture that we are a bunch of wild people that are letting people jump off bikes, throw up and do all these things because that is not, that's not fair. That's not what's happening. It's just what I see. But you don't see that on our bikes because, Correct. so that's why I'm saying. Yeah. So downtown is, is crazy. It's huge. There's a lot of things going on. And we have worked really hard to be respectful neighbors, to be good neighbors, to do everything that has been asked of this committee. And I just feel like I just, after your description of us, I just felt like I needed to say that's not us. And I just would like a fair depiction of who we are and that we have worked really hard. And I think if you ask Billy, you know, about this, we've spent a lot of meetings. We've, we've talked a lot with him. We've talked a lot with you guys. Whatever we have to do, we've been coming in here for four years trying to do the right thing. And there is a lot of things that are out of control downtown. I would bet my company and everything on it that we are not out of control. We are as in control as anybody downtown. And I would bet everything on that. You can put video cameras on every corner and watch us. You can come out and take a ride. You can listen to my staff. You could. I invite you to do all that so you know who we are and how we're operating as an industry between us two companies. And that's all. Okay, is, um, is Music City Crawler one of those two? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Okay, who, who else, who, who are we? So we're Rocket Sprocket, we're Pedal so Tavern. Sprocket Rocket. Rocket. Oh, Sprocket Rockets. Okay. Nashville Pedal Tavern. Okay. Country Music Crawler. And then Nashville Bar Bike. That's 19 total permits, correct? How many permits do you have? So they have two. Country Media Call has one. Uh, National Pedal Tavern has 10, and we have nine. What's your position about the boundaries that have been drawn up in this map that we have? We completely agree. So can you speak for the whole industry? Yeah, I don't, I don't want well, to speak well, to Well, let, let, me, let me try to put some, some boundaries on our public hearing today because I don't want this to devolve and, you know, pedal tavern um, free-for-all. Uh, and I use the word pedal tavern in the broadest sense, not, not, to, not to Nashville pedal tavern. Um, we're here having a public hearing on the boundaries. I, I understand that uh, we've raised some issues about quiet zones. I don't think that's properly before us today to have, you know, to us impose suddenly um, some quiet zone restrictions. Um, you know, we right now on the agenda is 
we're considering operation zone restrictions for our the pedal vehicles. I do think we we should consider uh, some quiet zones, and it sounds like the industry would be amenable to considering having some formal areas. Uh, I understand we've been operating informally to mm -hmm. try to keep the complaints down, uh, but perhaps that's that's insufficient. But but I would like to know if the industry is satisfied with these proposed boundaries. It sounds like you are, um, Emmett, and I'd like to, to know. I, I, I don't need to have a, a formal statement, but I would like to know if, if you guys are in agreement with the boundaries. Sure, we all met together um, with Ms. Allen and all the companies, and we all agreed. And just so you know, we would never go to 12 South or East Nashville because we've been doing this long. We know what's, what's right and what's wrong. We know what's going to really a geographically, we just can't we can't get over there anyways. So just geographically, we're bound to downtown and midtown anyways. So it's unless we trailered our bikes that took them to East Nashville or Twelve South or some, there's no way we can get over there anyways. So um, we've always operated in the same areas, and uh, I don't know who this bike is that popped up and started going to East or Twelve South, but they were illegal, and and that's what's you know was a huge part of I guess that started this whole thing, but. We've been operating the same for, for years in the same uh, small area. And our drivers, because there's, as you guys know, there's so many closures and there's so much construction, there's so much going on, that our drivers are trained to, um, when Public Works send out, sends out an email that says this road's gonna be closed during, uh, they don't say what time, they just say close. Or when the Preds uh, play and uh, the police will start to uh, close down roads. Our drivers know how to just get through all that safety. So it's very, it would be very difficult if you said, okay, you can never go down 3rd Avenue because well, what happens when 4th Avenue is closed and DeMumbrey is closed? And so as long as we're able to operate in this zone, our drivers are trained to do what they need to do to get around. To me, operation zone restrictions meant, you know, zone restrictions, which didn't necessarily mean an outside boundary. So if this isn't right forum for us to discuss that, then I'm going to suggest that we address that at a future meeting, possibly the next meeting, and get input from whoever wants to give it to us from these companies, because um, I feel pretty strongly about it. I, I think that's a really good suggestion. I, um, I would only ask. Um, Teresa or Tara to maybe comment on what needs to be done to properly notice that particular concern because so we can have uh, if we need to have a public hearing on quiet zone restrictions um, for certain streets we can get input from residents who live downtown we can get input from the, the pedal vehicle companies the police you know so we can fully consider it yeah yeah um so um the, the code doesn't specifically speak to quiet zones. Um, generally, you all are given rulemaking authority kind of um, to expand upon the, the code provisions um, and regulate these types of vehicles as long as it's not inconsistent with anything that council has passed by ordinance in the code. Um, in, in order to make rules, um, you are required to notice a public hearing in advance, um, and um, that is covered by um, Chapter 2 100. Just generally, that's a constraint for the commission to do any rulemaking, so I, I think that those requirements would have to be complied with in order for you all to consider rulemaking in the quiet zone area. Has the <coughs> sufficient notice been given about implementing a rule on an operational boundary so could we we're having vote a vote today and we are having a public hearing on that it says operation zone restriction for pedal ve pedal vehicles i think that's you know as far as the, the map that's been presented before you i mean i think that seems to describe what is being done adequately enough that someone who wished to attend and speak would be on notice that they would that this would be their opportunity to do that which is kind of the idea. But are we in position to be able to vote on it today? Yes. Okay. That was the short version of the one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, before we close the public hearing 
on the issue of operational zone restrictions. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this issue? I'm Brian Gleason with Nashville Pedal Tavern. And Angie Gleason with Nashville Pedal Tavern. Uh, I'd just like to formally say that I do appreciate um, the council member coming to us and asking for this meeting. I think we work the most productively when we're brought into as a group and we can have these discussions and openly talk about our operations. It's very hard to when we get one quick moment to try to say our piece here and there's no back and forth. So having that outside opportunity is huge. It allows us to explain and educate about our business better. Um, I have to agree with Emmett. Um, I would. I would love for you as well to come and see our operation. The first thing you see when you walk in our door is a massive code of conduct. The first thing you hear from our staff when you get on our bike is a repetition of all, those co co all that code of conduct, which specifically addresses almost every concern that you brought up. Um, our, our vehicles, because of all the overcrowding and all the difficulties downtown, we've had to restructure. We do not make stops downtown. We're at a tour, we make one stop where we stop for a bathroom break or for pictures. We do not pull over in random spots, let people off. People not, do not get on and off of our bike. Um, people do not get overly intoxicated or sick or throw up. If they do, their tour is immediately canceled and we leave at that point. Um, and I, I feel like for the last four years, I'd, I'd like to say that this regulation came about from two years of us contacting Billy Fields and asking for it. We saw the writing on the wall. We saw what Nashville was turning into and we wanted some sort of control so we didn't become um, kind of a punching bag because we're, we're very visible. We're very out there. It's part of our market. It's part of our industry. That's why we have an appeal. What we're seeing, I have to second this from Emmett, is we see hundreds of other people trying to tap into this type of industry in an unregulated fashion. They have extremely vulgar, vulgar music being played at very loud decibels. We have tiny little speakers, and what you hear is the people cheering and having fun on our, on our bikes. It's very different than a moving sound system blasting music downtown. We do not do that. Um, and I, I, I would love for anybody that wants to come to our office, come observe what we do, come see how our, our, our um, code of conduct is displayed, how our staff handles situations. We are extremely strict on how our customers um, conduct themselves on these tours. Now, we understand the perception can get out there. I had a, I had a church group on, no alcohol. They were drinking uh, Red Bulls, Gatorades, waters, and they were singing and dancing. And we had someone come up and berate one of the girls saying, you are a drunk, idiot and what do you you know it was it was it was unreal and they were just having a good time no alcohol involved no profanities anything like that so the perception is very hard for us to get over but i feel like we spent the last four years working with this this council and this board on being part of the solutions as a part of as opposed to being part of the problem and i, I want that to continue but i I also don't want to have to kind of fight for our jobs in our industry every time there's a change of somebody that comes in that hasn't been a part of those conversations that we've had over the last four years. Um, as far as the boundaries go, we are in agreement with them. Um, we've, been, <laughs> we've been operating the only area that we requested being that short, quiet zone is a two block stretch that we have been operating for nine years. Not one complaint. So the, the only reason we self-regulate on those areas is being quiet, that's not an issue. There's a partner bar that we get to and that's the only way to get to them is those two blocks. And again, we have been operating those, that stretch off 19th to Scarrett off of Grand for nine years. Not one single complaint. That we know of, at least. Yeah, that has been brought to our attention. And that is, and I was telling the councilwoman, um, we are, that we already enforce the noise in that area because we know that there's, obviously, there's residential over there. 
and there's event space and everything. And so we don't want to be interrupted when we go in that area. So we do tell everybody, just like we've been doing on Third Avenue, once you hit this block, the music goes off. And it, you can do as best, obviously, as we can, controlling the volume of the people. But we tell them, you know, library voices, that this and that, until we hit this corner. Once we hit that corner, we can turn the music up again. So, and we've been doing that, um, you know, just like Emmett was saying, we have been up here multiple times about Third Avenue for a long time. We've all been self-regulating. Our drivers and his are notified that music goes off. Um, and obviously because the music just instigates the people getting louder and louder. And we tell them library voices. Um, but as you know, they see people outside, people are waving to them, they're going to start woohooing. And I mean, you can't muzzle, you know, your riders. But we do as best as we can getting through that block. and trying to keep the peace as to say so we can make sure that we can use that as an outlet if we need to if there's road closures and I think we've we've worked together really well as, as well as even though we're competition we're competitors technically we we're fighting for this industry together so it's very important to us just as much it is as them that we all self-regulate ourselves and I feel like we proved that when the issues came up the year or two before about that that certain area being an issue we Emmett was in contact with me if he saw any any issues. I was in contact with him if we saw any issues, and we saw those complaints drop, and we're proud of that. And this is this is more than just this isn't some fly by night business. This is an industry that um, I want to let you know as well. There's these are kind of popping up all over the country and all over the world right now, and we've been asked to be the national training center for these because of our guidelines. We have more guidelines in our internal company than anybody does in this country. And we've been asked to help set up that franchise role for rules and regulations across the country and into Canada. So we take pride that we are doing the right steps to be controlled and to be professional and to be part of a community and not just an outsider. What, what is the governing agency or whatever it is that's asking you to be this national trainer? It's the, Nash, it's the uh, U.S. distributor for these vehicles. It's called Pedal Pub. Okay. And it's Pedal Pub Global, and they were bought out last year um, to turn this into a franchise model. And they reached out to us, and they've actually been hosting their training here quarterly. And again, I would love for you to come. I don't think we've had one member come to our office and observe our code of conducts, how we check groups in the screening process before they even get on our vehicles that nobody else in the country does. They do electro electronic waivers, show up, get on the bikes. We do paper waivers just so we can have them physically come in front of us, sign a waiver, have a communication to make sure that they're of mind and sound body, they're not intoxicated before they get on our bikes. Nobody else takes that extra step, but we do, and we'd love for you guys to come see that. Well, you just met the one council person who will, so right. I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate that. My only other question is, let me see what you told me. <clears throat> Where do we find these codes of conduct? Where do I go if I want to see what it is? Where we have. Um, well, the groups get notified in their confirmation email that they have a, there's a code of conduct. And then the drivers all have laminated like a list that they basically, they have to make it look like, okay, this is coming from the top. I have to read this before we can get through the fun stuff. So all the drivers all do that at the very beginning of their tour. And then we also have a sign in the store when you're checking in. There's a big sign, um, like a sandwich board sign that says what our code of conduct is. And so they're notified that all of these are black and white issues. And if anybody violates this, they're, if it's like a single person, they're kicked off immediately. The driver also has the discretion to cut the tour off immediately if it's you know more than one person or whatnot. Um, and since we've implemented that, the end of towards in the fall of last year, the drivers have said that the just the camaraderie of the groups and everything and their behavior has diminished so much more just by having that. They can still have that I'm your buddy role but these are the rules that are coming from, you know, management and ownership, and so we got to follow these or you're done. So they've said that that's helped a lot. Okay, so if I want to see one last question. 
you'll indulge me, if I want to see the different codes of conduct for the different companies and compare them and see who's doing what and who's not doing what, I have to go, I should go to each individual one? Or are they, is there somewhere on your website that says it? Or how does that work? Um, I can't speak for the other companies. Ours isn't on our web, so I, I, we might have it in our FAQs maybe. Okay. Um, but I know that we, just from discussions, that when we're all self-monitoring and, you know, we know what, um, what Emmett's drivers are required to do, he knows what ours are required to do, and they all fall in the same guidelines. Okay. We'd be happy to send it as well. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. You can probably find my information on the TLC website. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Melanie Moran, and I live in the 12 South neighborhood. Um, I just wanted to thank Councilmember Allen for working so quickly on this, and Mr. Fields for being so responsive, and to y'all for hearing um, our concerns and acting on them. Um, I just wanted to raise the concern that we're here today talking about pedal taverns, and we already had boundaries for golf carts, but if the new boundaries are only going to apply to pedal taverns, we might find ourselves here again for hot tubs and tractors and whatever else these folks dream up. So I would just want to advocate for boundaries for transportainment operators in general, rather than piecemeal on the particular type of vehicle. Um, and the other point I just wanted to make, I don't think this group can really do anything about this, but this industry has exploded in Nashville, as we've heard, and we know over the last couple of years, and we still just have Mr. Fields and, and two folks responsible for this, and scooters, and an entire new, um, very visible, very impactful um, industry in town. and. He's a superhero, in my opinion, and I'm incredibly grateful for his work. But um, we often hear about the tax benefits to our city from this burgeoning uh, industry. But I'm not necessarily seeing those benefits to Metro. Um, and I would like to advocate in whatever form is possible that some of these proceeds go to actually staffing uh, regulatory offices, enforcement offices, that are charged with dealing with all of our individual complaints every day and working with all the operators. Thank you. Thank you. At this point in time, we'll close the public hearing so that the commission can deliberate on the consideration of operational zone restrictions for pedal vehicles. Can I ask a question? Of course. Uh, excuse my ignorance, but apparently we are not regulating all of these vehicles? I know you talked to me about tractors. So we, who's regulated and who isn't? <laughs> we are limited to vehicles which this commission has authority over to vehicles of 14 passengers and a driver making a total of 15. Most of the vehicles that have entered into, into the transportainment industry, as we describe it, are above that number. We, this commission two years ago, recommended the Metro Council to increase that number. We did make the recommendation. The council did approve it to go up to a total of 22 passengers. Unfortunately, a state law that was, we, it was a very challenging state law. We found after the fact that actually said we are limited to 15. So we are let, still continue to be limited. Most of the vehicles that you see have, they are carrying more passengers than we have authority to regulate. Do you have that citation for that state statute at all? Um, or can you get it? You don't have to do it right this minute. I can, get I can certainly you. get it for yeah. you. I, I might be able to find it <clears throat> on um, Lexus. It's not important right this minute. But. So, so to, to clarify. It's not, it's not super clear cut. You kind of have to read two or three state statutes in conjunction with each other to come to the conclusion. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah, I can put something together for you. Did Thanks. we ask for an AG opinion, or did we just make that decision ourselves? Um, I, not recalling off the top of my head if there's an AG opinion on point. Um, in general, I, I believe a state elected official has to request an AG opinion. Right. Oh, yeah, it's pretty easy. Okay. We get anybody to do it. So right now, the we really only have 
a limited issue before us, which is the consideration of operational zone restrictions for pedal vehicles. Pedal vehicles are defined as um, the uh, literally they, they actually could include um, single passenger vehicles, but we I don't believe actually have any in operation anymore. So really we're talking about the um, pedal tavern type bicycles that have multiple passengers uh, pedaling along. Um, Councilman Brown and Councilman uh, Withers have both uh, presented before us a proposed boundary um, and the companies themselves have not voiced any objection to having, uh, having operational boundaries. I do think it makes sense um, given the, the concerns brought by um, Councilman Brown and Councilman Withers. Thank you, Alan. Alan, excuse me, I, I apologize for misstating your name. Uh, I think it makes sense for us to consider putting in these restrictions. Um, I know, I, I gather from some of the questions that, that um, some of you may, may think that um, we shouldn't be tackling this in a piecemeal manner, but but right now the only issue before us is operational zone restrictions. So we, we do need to limit our deliberation on whether or not we agree there needs to be operational zone restriction. Well, I would applaud the industry and the council people and the and, and Mr. Fields all getting together. Someone made a comment that uh, they liked the way that worked. Uh, I have to say it seems to make our job easier up here to review the proposal when everybody comes to us and has sort of mediated a, a conclusion. And there hasn't been any dissatisfaction with set or anybody that's opposing setting the boundary. And from a staff standpoint, clearly involvement of the Metro Council is very helpful. Councilman Sledge was also involved in the process. And uh, when, when the council is able to bring us information directly from the neighborhoods, because they're closer to the neighborhoods than we are, share directly with us, uh, it makes it a whole lot easier for me to bring the industry in and say, here are, the, here are your witnesses, here are the people that have issues. Now, how do we fix it? So thank you. This already uh, how is the current boundary different or is there just none there is no boundary. there's none at all no for, gotcha. for the, <coughs> for the pedal, pedal bikes okay. typically their ability to pedal is what's limited to the boundary <laughs> and and the ability for the where the business is and so it's been a self it's been a self-regulation from that standpoint and we've chosen not to go forward because again we've not had that issue raised if now that it's been raised <coughs> that's what's brought us today Mm -hmm. So the only alteration somebody mentioned of the map that was presented to us would be going south to 19th and Grand versus what's currently on there, which I think is 18th and Edge Hill. Is that right? I think Lady Allen is the uh, guru on this particular <laughs> issue. <laughs> I think I can clarify. What you see drawn there includes the little part that goes all the way south to Edge Hill. It shows that, yes. Yeah. So the only, I mean, the only alteration is there are a few li interior lines that don't really mean anything. So those can be disregarded. So they just incorporated for a pedal tavern instead. Correct. They use to go to a specific Correct. bar. Correct. So nothing, right? nothing would need to be added okay. to Thank this. You. And I would just add one thing. The, the idea of the quiet, quiet zones came from the traffic study that was done by mm -hmm. KCI last year where they had recommended a couple of those areas. So. I knew I'd seen it somewhere, but mm -hmm. that's where it came from. So if the commission were, were to adopt the map as is, what we would do is work with uh, uh, the traffic engineers uh, at Public Works to uh, identify specifically those streets as the map as the map is identified, then we put the words with it and create the uh, rule that would uh, would represent your decision today. 
then we would also place the map on. We'd have it drawn by the engineers and have it placed online. Has there been any input um, from the provided by any of the, you know, the Hall of Fame up here, the Capitol, the people in the Capitol, but like, is anybody speaking on this at all, or is this? We've, we've not had any, uh, you've got all, all the information that come in, you have it. May I just ask you one question, Ms. Allen? Yeah. The, so the eastern, this is so loud. The eastern um, boundary here, is that, I have terrible vision. Is that second avenue by the river there? Is that first avenue? What, what is shown is first avenue. So I mean, that, basically what we did was more or less took the area where they are operating now and drew just another street or two over to give them enough flexibility to deal with street closures. Um, in some areas, it's more than a few streets, but for the most part, we started with the, the route of where they actually are, again, as determined by the, um, the traffic study that was done previously. Okay. Lily, can we see that next time when we get around to talking about the future issues? Can we see that traffic study, or is it on our oh, website? Oh, it, it's actually on the website, but it's I'll provide you a copy. I, the one I looked at, I could barely read. I'll provide your copy. It's hard having a blind person on the No problem. We'll provide mission. your copy. Thanks. Okay. Right. It comes down third and then goes over Union, I think, and then gets over to first. Third. Okay. I see. And some of, some of the streets that are part of the boundary, I think a few of them may actually have speed limits that are so high that they can't travel on them. So I'm going to give uh, Terry my language that sort of mentions that that they're restricted to certain streets by, by, by a previous um, speed limit limitation. Anything else? I, I'm sorry, no. Okay. That's good, thank you. Great. I was going to, I hate to interrupt, but I was going to convey the section of the TCA, we were able to find it, that I was referencing earlier. Okay. It's section 751-1005. And it, again, you, you have to look at two or three different um, provisions in order to string it all together. But it says, this part shall not apply to any motor vehicle, and this part, 751 part 10, is the um, part that gives municipalities the authority to regulate passenger vehicles for hire. And so in saying this part shall not apply, it means municipalities are not given the authority to regulate um, any motor vehicles operating passenger services that are subject to the authority of the Department of Safety pursuant to Title 65, Chapter 15. So then you have to look at Title 65, Chapter 15 which does give the Department of Safety the authority to regulate vehicles that have 15 passengers or more, including the driver, my goodness. And so um, kind of when you look at those in conjunction with each other, <coughs> that's where we have drawn the conclusion that we cannot regulate those over 15. So are we considering them motor vehicles then? I mean, are they defined as motor vehicles even though they're operating by pedals? In terms of the de definition of motor vehicles, that's usually for like registration requirements, and they are subject to those requirements. Uh, whether the pedal carriages are subject to those regulations, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I don't think so. I but think she was looking at the statute as to answer your question. Yes, why we other types of vehicles barges, like the party barges, tractor, trailers, yes. party yes. buses. Exactly. 
So yes, we do have authority under state law also specifically to regulate, um, uh, I think they call them, they want to maybe pedal carriages and rickshaws, rickshaws. or something like that. Um, so there's another provision of state law that also specifically authorizes us to regulate the, um, the, the pedal carriages. Okay. But it's, it is separate <coughs> from the other types of motor vehicles that you're talking about. Okay, so you're telling me that the state of Tennessee is prohibiting Metro Nashville from regulating rolling hot tubs and rolling fake fire engines. Only if the passenger um, uh, maximum um, exceeds the... 15. Yes, as I understand it. Appreciate it. Thank you. So at this point, I don't mean to kind of push us along here, but again, what we have before us is just whether or not we want to enter and pass a, a rule that sets operational boundaries for, for the pedal bikes. Uh, currently, there are no operational boundaries. It's just... Uh, purely kind of a market demand has dictated where they they operate and uh, right now they're operating well within these boundaries for the most part um, so this would be placing a formal restriction on where they can operate do you need a motion yes okay i'll make a motion to approve it second uh, second do you need that to be a little more formalized or yes uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any nays? I'm abstaining for now. Right. Motion passes. Bill, do you need a, to be specific about the, uh, the map, or is if, that if enough? If you were to adopt the map that, Councilor, if, if what you took a vote on, I think what I think I heard was you were voting on the map that was presented by Councilor Lady Allen, then what we would do is take that as our adoption area. Again, we would formalize it a little bit through the traffic engineers, and then uh, that would be, we would then extract the names off of the outside boundary and say, this is the, this is the outer perimeter of the, and then place it on the website and put it in your rules. And clearly, just as for uh, Commissioner Palmer, any of you, the rules can always be revisited, changed, deleted with notice. Right. So if there are issues with this particular that you have a you want to come back and revisit, it's just a matter of requesting it through the chair or through the commission, and we would certainly be able to do that. With notice and a public hearing. Correct. Okay, right, I'll, I'll support your motion. Change my vote. Can you do that? <laughs> Yes. Otherwise, we're left with no boundaries at all. So I, 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 I like it. Thanks for the clarification. Just in case we need that. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Um, we'll now move on to our next item on our agenda. We have another public hearing. Um, there's a request by Lyft to expand. There are SUMDs under MCL 12.62, um, which is the pilot program. Um, they want to expand, uh, I believe, uh, the number of SUMDs. You'll recall if in January, to, oh, I'm sorry. They want to increase their fleet to 1,000 1, total. I apologize. I did not mean to interrupt. The, you recall the, the January meeting there where we had similar requests from uh, two of the other companies. And again, you have two requests today. Uh, I would defer to legal in terms of describing the, the pilot program allows for 
expansion, and I'll defer back to legal on that. Sure. So um, what we're looking at for that is Section 1262.080, which was actually, that particular section was actually amended by the most recent amendment of that code section, which was in um, Substitute Bill BL 2018-1441 as amended. And so as amended, it says um, in Section 1262.080D, each expansion or increase in fleet size, including each incremental increase in 1262.080B, shall require the following. One, a determination by the MTLC or its staff that the permitted operator has fulfilled the requirements of this chapter. B, the number of violations associated with the SUMDs of that operator is below a threshold to be established by the MTLC. And C, the type or category of SUMD in the permitted operator's current fleet to be increased is meeting or exceeding the average utilization threshold. Two, a publicly noticed hearing conducted before the MTLC for purposes of determining public preference regarding increases in SUMD volume. So that's, that's the current code provision on this issue. Um, then in past um, meetings, um, this commission has established um, a number of violations associated with the SUMDs and has established the threshold for the number of violations um, that, that, um, that ha you have to be below in order to qualify for this expansion, and that number was 20 per year. Um, however, I'm not sure we have any significant number of violations in these particular cases? In, in the pilot program, one of the things when we talk about violations, uh, they have to be sustained violations. If, for instance, we have had a number of complaints uh, or inquiries, whatever you want to call it, on uh, probably all of the companies saying this is parked illegally, this is parked improperly, this is blocking this, this is blocking that. Under the current ordinance, uh, the pilot, they have two hours to respond to correct it. Um, and again, we do have, we, we are challenged in terms to be able to check all of them, but uh, for instance, yesterday, uh, I personally reported uh, uh, some problems, which then I went back in two hours to make sure they were corrected. So uh, the short answer, that's the long answer, short answer is the complaints are, uh, they're basically dealing with the complaints as they come in, as far as we can tell through our enforcement efforts. Do we have any discretion as a commission uh, to decline additional um, scooters because of Metro Police's stated um, statement that they're unable to enforce the um, current rules regulating SUMDs? Um, I mean, I don't necessarily read Section D to provide for anything like that. Um, it does, it does, it's, ma the mandatory language is, requires what the floor is for being granted the expansion. It says, <coughs> shall require the following. It doesn't say that you shall grant the expansion, but I think what you would have to be careful to do would be to not refuse to grant the expansion based on, um, anything that would be arbitrary and capricious. Um, and right. we have granted two prior expansions based on their meeting these criteria. Except that was, they were, you know, I, I know we have granted additional permits and certificates for other um, transportation type vehicles without regard to the fact that there may be a company or a per person later on seeking permits, and if if we've decided that there isn't a need now, I know that's a different yeah. issue for those particular permits. But my, my the point is is simply because we have given additional SUMDs to other companies, in my opinion, would not be arbitrary and capricious to to decline Lyft and and Uber here ad additional SUMDs. So. I don't know, disagree with that statement necessarily. I, I just think you have to be careful to articulate your rationale for making the distinction. Um, but what I would say is the other context that you're referencing um, are um, 
areas where there is some kind of prerequisite finding of public con necessity and convenience um, prior to granting new certificates. Um, and that... Right. And I think that for this commission to... And I'm not speaking for the commission. I'm just voicing my thoughts here. Um, but for the commission to decline additional permits for SUMDs, we would need to make a finding that um, f for public safety reasons, you know, we, we don't feel that the city can sustain additional SUMDs at this time and give stated reasons. Yes. Um, so public safety is, is always an area of concern for this commission. Thank you for clarifying that because I, I think that's really important for us to consider that as we hear um, the application from Lyft as well as the application from Jump for an expansion of their SUMDs um, on the streets. Billy, do we have anyone besides the companies who have asked to speak on this issue? Not that I'm aware of. There may be some folks in the audience, as always, that did not fill out a form. All right, we'll go ahead and hear from uh, this Lyft. This right here is replaced by this language. Hello. Hello, good afternoon. Um, my name is Melanie Goggins, and I'm a compliance manager for Lyft. Thank you so much for considering our fleet increase and for having me this afternoon. On behalf of Lyft, I would like to respectfully request the commission exercise the authority provided to it and provide Lyft to increase its fleet to 1,000 shared urban mobility devices or scooters. Lyft has met all the requirements for an increase in the Metropolitan Code of Laws. This includes exceeding the minimum utilization rate of three rides per scooter per day, um, as well as currently receiving no violations um, and meeting all the requirements in Chapter 12. Lyft has proudly offered scooters in Nashville since December of last year. Since that time, our goal has been to expand transportation access while respecting the public right of way and protecting public safety. Allowing us to expand our scooter fleet will enable us to better serve communities while maintaining our high record of compliance with the MTLC regulations. We appreciate your consideration and are open to any feedback or questions you may have. Oh yes, that would be great. SUMDs is Lyft currently operating? Currently we have 500. And you want another 500? Yes. So in general, the rule provides for expansion in the second month of operation up to <coughs> 750 and to um, 1,000 beginning of the third month of the pilot. Um, these expansions are subject to the criteria in D that we talked about earlier. Um, the, but um, because they are beyond their third month of operation. They're asking to jump from the 500 to the 1,000 and kind of skip the 750. I think you'll notice that our high utilization rate warrants the additional scooters. Um, we also understand your concerns that more scooters on the street could lead to more compliance issues. Lyft actually has a dedicated staff um, every day that from the morning until sunset operates through the downtown area to make sure that scooters are charged and in compliance with all parking rules. We actually, I don't know if you all have seen, but we introduced what we call trikes. These are electric bicycles that um, pull kind of like a wagon for us to put any scooters that we need to pick up. And we think that these trikes have been really useful in addressing safety concerns, parking, and it's also been a really sustainable way to ensure that our scooters are in compliance rather than having these big bulky bands bulky vans blocking the streets. When we've had um, Metro uh, Police talk about these, these issues before, and I believe Sergeant Bork um, has addressed these issues before when we were considering expansion, expansion of the SUMDs earlier, 
um, we've, we've asked the police just directly, are you able to enforce the ordinance surrounding SUMBs to, for example, uh, no riding of SUMBs on sidewalks, uh, ticketing someone for riding on a sidewalk, ticketing someone for uh, having two people on a on an SUMD at once, uh, and Metro PD has told us no, just flat out, and that's 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 my concern. I understand that. Um, Lyft believes that it can uh, enforce compliance, but I, I don't see how your riders are going to comply uh, when they're not already now, and they're you have 500 SUMDs. So the fact that you're asking for an increase doesn't make me believe that suddenly there's going to be enforcement. Right. I understand that concern, and we have been working with Sergeant Fork. We met with him about um, the events this week, and we do want to be good corporate partners in Nashville. This is Lyft's second home. It's our second largest office. We have a staff of over 700 people here. And so I think what we would say is that enforcement is not only on Sergeant Fork and his team. Um, we would like to help out with that. So that's why user education is really important to us. And so as we expand our fleet, we would obviously expand the staff that's charged with monitoring the scooters throughout the day. But we also want to be really proactive, right? So one thing that we're trying in Nashville, um, and I think we just implemented last week, is that we're um, attaching physical tags to each of the scooters. So right now, if a user opens their app and they want to go through their first scooter ride, they see um, all of the rules for riding safely and parking, and they kind of swipe through them before the ride. But in case for some reason the users missed that or they've forgotten by their third ride and they didn't want to go through them again, they're going to see something on the scooters that says, no riding on the sidewalk, uh, don't park in ADA areas. Um, so we'll see how that works. And we're looking forward to trying different things like that to help out. Comparison to the previous um, request that was granted from Bird and Lime, um, that um, Lyft and Jump, at least Lyft for sure, we haven't heard from Jump yet, are making the request prior to expansion, whereas the other two companies did ask for forgiveness after the fact. Well, I, I understand that that is a interesting fact, but. I, I still think that would be distinct and doesn't hinder our decision on declining additional SUMDs just because another company broke the rule doesn't mean that it sh we should disregard our... Well, they're not in violation now because their expansion to 1,000 was I approved by the commission. I understand. I'm not suggesting that currently the other companies are in violation right now. Can I ask a question? Uh, are we in danger of uh, substituting our judgment for council's judgment? I mean, they passed this thing twice, uh, for better or for worse, and they could have banned them, right? I yeah, mean, yeah. they had legal authority to ban them. That, that is correct. I mean, okay, and they it, set the standards uh, for better or for worse <laughs> in both those ordinances. You know, I'm not the lawyer, and I get accused of acting like that <laughs> sometimes, and I apologize for that. Um, I'm neither for nor against expansions. My, my role, there's two things that my role is regulated, and then the council specifically asked me and others to work to find innovative ways to make this work if possible. The expansions, it was, it's, it's my general impression that when the council passed this, they did a couple of things. They did one, they specifically talked about we will not limit the number of companies. Do I agree with that? Probably not. I discussed that with them publicly in public hearings with the council, but well, we the council some concerns about that from an antitrust perspective. As correct, well, so. correct. But, but so I mean, and, and I mean, legal was probably right on that. But again, from a from a uh, administrative standpoint, it's it's a challenge, and I won't deny that. The other thing that they did, they established the the way in which they would expand up to a thousand. Then they were very specific, saying the metro count, that the commission has absolute authority over anything from a thousand and one forward. 
the, the in between was where I've always I've been we've had issues about okay did, what was the legislative intent and not only what was the intent what did it say yeah. and that's yeah. where so we are again in this most recent clarification or revision of this Metro Code chapter um, that particular issue was more clarified to make it clear that these criteria do and we had interpreted it that way before, but just to make it absolutely crystal clear right. that these three criteria do apply to the expansions from 500 to 750 and from 750 to 1,000. Um, so, um, and well, that's, that second ordinance also set a drop dead date for the pilot program. Right? Yes, that's true. So the There's council intended sunset. for all of this potentially to end, there, that there's way, a or at least to be reconsidered. Right. When is that? Okay. Um, it is. May of May of 2020. Yeah. Um, I thought it was at the very end. It's essentially a year from now. Or a year, or a year and a month. Oh, here it is. Um, April 1, 2020. Yeah. A year. And then what happens then? They have to pass a new ordinance if they want to allow scooters again. Mm -hmm. That's my concern. It says it may be extended <laughs> before such date by a resolution of the Metropolitan Council. My concern is that when we were considering it the last time, I was under the impression that if they met this standard, that we our hands were tied and we had to. I honestly, give the chair's them interpretation grace. is a new twist that I, I well, have not thought of before. Yeah, so but I, what I I'm saying is that we that actually were, well. if they met the standard, then we yeah. had to extend the grace to them and forgive them for their expanding without approval. But they took the position that they could expand since they met the criteria. And I understood that our, if they met that baseline criteria, our hands were tied, and I wondered why it was even coming in front of us. I had the same exact question. And I, 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 so today, I, I, now we're right. getting the idea that maybe they're coming before us because they've got to ask for uh, us well, to authorize the increase. I, I believe that we as a commission certainly have an obligation to always consider public safety. I mean, that's the reason why we exist as a commission. And the council has vested with us the obligation and responsibility to implement their ordinance that they passed with respect to SUMDs and interpret its ordinance with respect to SUMD, SUMDs. And we have the uh, advantage and privilege of having um, Metro Legal help advise us on what we can and can't do. Um, I, I raised at the previous meeting my concern about enforcement. Um, and it's still a concern that I have when we have Metropolitan Police Department telling us, the commission, that they do not have sufficient resources to enforce these rules against the SUMDs. And I think it's foolhardy for us to consider expanding the number of SUMDs when we have Metro PD telling us explicitly that they are unable to enforce these rules. And until that changes, I don't see why we should consider additional SUMDs. The pilot program is, exists because it is a pilot program. It is to see how can we have this industry operate. Um, it, is, it is an innovative industry. There's clearly a demand for it. Um, and it's been very successful in many ways, but this is a pilot program. Uh, we've got to implement it and allow it to unfold, mm -hmm. but we still have to consider public safety, and we have to consider the fact that Metro PD is telling us they can't enforce the rules that are already on the books. Well, I think it's obvious that the police department are never going to enforce, are going to be able to, or are ever going to take it under their responsibility to enforce the rules for scooters. And it's also obvious that the operators, the people using them, are not going to follow the rules if they don't want to. They're going to ride on the sidewalk, they're going to zip around, they're going to, whenever it's getting crowded on the street, they're going to move over to the sidewalk and go wherever they want. And they're going to go through uh, yellow lights and red lights uh, whenever they think they can get away with it, just like bicycle riders do, unless they're conscientious. Car so and I some car drivers. <laughs> but, so, so my question is, when's the industry going to come to us with some way of enforcing the regulations that are there. You know, the golf carts, golf carts, the electric golf carts on golf courses 
cannot go in certain areas because they shut off if you begin to drive onto an area that's prohibited on the golf course, like the greens, the putting greens, or in some, some other areas. The cart has got geofencing where it literally shuts off. Why are you not coming to us with some mechanism, some similar mechanism to where these, th these scooters will shut down or bill the user on their credit card an additional $50 if they go into a, a prohibited zone? That, I think, would cause the user to suddenly get in compliance. So, oh, so it's great that you mentioned geofencing technology. Um, that's something that we do use. It's um, really useful, especially for large no parking or no ride areas. Um, so, uh, for example, for the events this week, I'm sure there will be a no ride area that's geofenced. Um, and just to further streamline the flow of traffic, we're creating two um, pickup drop off locations for the scooters so that scooters are directed to specifically park there. Um, so I love that you raised that point. That's something that we're open to. What's it, to what are you doing to keep them off the sidewalks today? Um, that's a great question. So our rebalancing crew is a huge part of that. They, as I mentioned before, are on the streets from essentially sun up to sundown, making sure that there aren't scooters left on the sidewalks inappropriately. I'm um, not talking about left, ridden on the sidewalks. That's a, that's a great question. So user education, I think, is our biggest way to kind of attack that. It's not working. Right. So I think we are open to any ideas you may have. Unfortunately, geofencing wouldn't be the right solution for operating on a sidewalk, only because it's not accurate enough yet to just single out a sidewalk. But if there's a really big problem on Broadway, for example, we could completely geofence Broadway out of our coverage zone. <coughs> but the specific sidewalk, that solution wouldn't work for yet. It I've been doing a little research trying to make sure I understood geofencing because you do have that as a part of your agenda today. It's, it's uh, what I'm advised by all the companies is they have they can they can geofence within five to fifteen feet. You know, in a in in they have a real challenge when they get that small. For instance, I ask about sidewalks. Can I geofence a sidewalk? If they can geofence a football field, pretty simple. If you want to do a sidewalk, the way it was described to me is you're actually going with uh, with beacons. Uh, small devices that would actually identify, it would be sending a signal out to the scooters as they get on the street to either stop them or slow them down. So, it, I mean, those things are possible. It's a matter of, of how does it work and, and where, where can you make it work. We, again, we're going to be suggesting some geofenced areas a little bit later uh, as a part of your hearing. And... Uh, but yes, all the companies can do it. I'll speak for all the companies one they can geofence. It's also important to us for us to set user norms. I think that'll be a big way to tackle sidewalk riding. So we've been in operation since December, which is I don't know how many months, I have no conception of time or math. <laughs> um, but I think as we do have more, we call them street ambassadors on the street, kind of catching users in the act and redirecting them to the street, I think that'll be really helpful. So you're proposing putting company people out there to monitor the use of the scooters. That's what we have now. How many yes. are out there doing it now? Um, I'm not sure. I know I can get back to you on that. And I know during the events this week, we'll have at least 15 or 16 people at all times um, on the streets, including in the two areas. Um, our because two what, designated what you areas. could be doing, you, you don't know how many and you don't know where, but what you could be doing is providing what the chairperson is pointing out is that we don't have the police resources to monitor the, the scooters. Right. And if you were self-monitoring with your own people out there actually taking the scooters away from people or finding them, that might, that might meet our concern or exactly. address our concern. That's, yes, that's exactly the goal so of our So how many people police. are you going to put out there and how, what authority are they going to have? So we know folks are not riding on the sidewalks. Um, I'll have to get back to you on that, with the proposal on that. And again, I know I l keep looking like I'm cheerleading or pushing. Max Lucen is the local general manager. Max is in a meeting in San Francisco, so he's not here. He might, he may or may not have been able to answer a question. I don't know, but she, you're at a distinct disadvantage from the standpoint of local management. You can give, obviously, you can give broad ideas of, of how it works nationwide, and but specifically locally. That would not be, and I, 
again, I can't speak for Max. I can I can share with you that that the companies for the weekend, for instance, or this week, all the companies uh, have recognized the need for boots on the ground. In our general meetings, they understand the need for boots on the ground on the sidewalks. Part of the program you're going to hear in a little bit are some crowds also, so we've got two more issues coming where we're going to be proposing a mini pilot for where they park in an area, the downtown area, that will propose exactly what you're talking about, but using uh, uh, the staff that we have as well as some of the other public work staff to be able to try to monitor where they're being parked in an area of the downtown area. Okay, I was going to add a couple of other variables for your consideration as well. Um, to the chair's point, I wanted to um, point out section 1262.020H, which says the MTLC is authorized to promulgate regulations to interpret and administer this chapter. So you are, to the extent that the code itself does not say something inconsistent, you are given pretty broad interpretation and rulemaking authority here. Um, uh, the other um, thing that I was going to bring up, Billy kind of just touched on, which is that MNPD, under state law and under the Metro um, Charter and Code, um, Met Metro employees who are specifically given authority over a particular issue may issue citations in addition to police officers. However, I think Billy will tell you that they are struggling to meet their <laughs> obligations with the staff that they have, but that, that is um, another possibility for enforcement as well as police officers, just in theory. So, Ms. Uh, oh. Goggins. I think they threw you to the wolves sending you in here today, and I think that was probably intentional so that you wouldn't know how to answer our questions, and I think they probably thought we would punt and say we approved it because we approved the other ones, except we didn't because they did it without our knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so I have never seen one of these ambassadors or trikes or whatever they are. Who, how, how would I recognize them? What are, are they wearing something special? Where are they? Because I'm downtown all the time, and I've never seen one. Well, it's good that they aren't getting in your way. Um, well, there's that. There is that. Uh, so the trikes are branded as Lyft. I'm not sure if our street ambassadors are wearing t-shirts. I would assume so, but I would like to confirm that before saying that on the record. They should be. And, and what are they? So they're supposedly being responsible partly for at least moving ones that are placed on the sidewalk or left in heaps, like I see them about every day. Yes, so their main role is to ensure parking compliance, but they're also available for um, safety or any user questions. Um, and something that I failed to mention earlier is that in our terms of service, Lyft users, scooter users, or rideshare users um, do have to comply with local regulations. And so if we are finding that um, we have repeat offenders on sidewalks or parking in ADA ramps, we are able to terminate their rights to use the Lyft platform at any time. And that is something that a street ambassador could flag for our trust and safety team. And how many of those have you flagged? Uh, to my knowledge, we have not had any user accounts terminated over parking compliance issues. But um, I would like to follow up with you also to confirm that. Have you had user accounts terminated for other reasons? I'm not sure. I'll have to get back to you on that. I would like you to get back to us on all of those things. <laughs> Just in broad with all the companies, one of the issues we had very early on was uh, people below the age of uh, 18 riding them, M multiple companies, and again, I don't have the numbers because I'm not the one turning them off, but multiple companies were actually went in terminated, con terminated use because of inappropriate use of the people below the age. Right. We do require a driver's license, which helps with a little bit of that issue, but you can be 16 and get a license, you need to be 18 to ride a scooter, so um, we do monitor for that as well. So I think the scooters are turning, and all the other things, but they're certainly contributing to a circus environment downtown. Um, I've witnessed personally accidents, people flying off them, somebody drove into a car um, on one occasion. I spoke with a, I was at a meeting not too long ago with a panel, um, including a um, trauma surgeon who 
stated that they're seeing at least two serious head injuries a month. And um, if that's the case there, I imagine it's the case at other hospitals as well. I don't think there's any question whatsoever, at least there's not in my mind, that um, the public safety is an issue. Um, there's clearly no question that enforcement is, is <coughs> lax, if not non-existent. Um, I've never seen any data about the complaints. Um, I don't think that fines are actually being assessed. I could be wrong about that, but I'd sure like to know whether they are, how many they are, you know, what the data is. We come in here and everybody says, well, they're, they're in compliance. And it just simply does not comport with what I see with my own eyes and what I hear from my neighbors and downtown downtown residents and even tourists and visitors. Um, so I have an issue with it. I, 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 I did have an issue in January. I don't think I was here for one of the prior requests for expansion, but I was here for the second one and my recollection is that we were in fact told that the company went ahead and did it on their own and that was disturbing. So kudos for coming and you know, seeking permission. Um, but I, I just feel that, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a moot point to talk about the pilot having been put into place that, you know, shouldn't have happened, it did happen, that's all well and good. Um, but, you know, it's going to end in a year, and we're here a year in asking you about all these things we've been talking about for a year already. When we talked about them when the pilot program was first um, announced and these concerns were raised and they were raised with the GMs um, and the, the various representatives that came in and met with certain council people were there. I recall Tom, uh, Tom Turner from the National Downtown Partnership was there um, and everybody punted on those concerns and it sounds like they're still punting and again you're, you got thrown to the wolves because everything I hear you saying is, well, I don't, you know, I'd have to get back to you on that. We're certainly open to ideas. You guys have been given ideas, and you guys have been, you know, given chances and, and told, you know, here are the issues. They haven't been addressed in all this time. Um, I have no confidence that they're going to be addressed in the next year. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan. I understand your perspective, and... Um, I hope that you don't feel, or I understand that you do feel like we're still punting on issues, but um, I hope that I can bring some clarity. One thing that you mentioned was action, pardon me, I just combined two words, accident and injury data. And so that's something that we provided you today. Um, I think the reason that I've punted on other things, such as the number of staff we'll have on the street at all times, or um, whether or not our operation staff wears lift branded t-shirts, those are things that I'm 99% confident I could give you today, but I don't want to provide faulty data. So um, that's why I would like to get back to you on those issues. No, I understand. I mean, rider public injuries reported. One, is this in the last 30 days? Or I wonder if you're looking that, at the right that, document. That's um, jumps this Seven injuries since December 20th. I'm sorry, I'm going to borrow this. We launched on December 20th, just for context. December 20th of 18? Yes. Okay, so you're one of the new ones. Okay. That's right. I keep forgetting we had a wave. And where are these reports coming from? The number of accidents reported. I mean, where are you getting these reports from the riders? Yes, so riders can um, report accidents through the app, through the Lyft app, or we also have our 24-7 um, trust and safety team that's available by phone, and the number to that is on every Lyft scooter. Actually, that team that picks up that call is headquartered in Nashville, um, so it's usually a local person talking. Um, if someone reports an accident, we, our trust and safety team reaches out to them within 90 seconds on the phone. Um, they, they aim to resolve the issue within two hours, and then once the issue is resolved, they send up a follow-up email just to make sure that 
we really did square everything away. So the trusted safety team, there's, you said there's a phone number, they call. You can reach them by phone. Um, by email would probably be the slowest way, so I wouldn't advise that. Um, or through the app. And they're local? They are local, yeah. But they're not the people that are out on the streets patrolling looking for... Totally separate, yeah. Insurance. So if you call our trust and safety line, um, you'll talk to someone who is trained in those issues. And then our um, rebalancing crews, as we call them, on the street, those people are trained in kind of the parking regulations and knowing how to look for um, out of compliance scooters or users on sidewalks or et cetera. I cannot find that page. It was a handout. It's front and back. It's the one you just gave us. Here. <laughs> I know you just gave it to us. Um, right now, we concentrate their activities downtown because that's where we see the most parking issues, but they're nimble. So if we were to see issues springing up in neighborhoods, we would send them there. Um, we're able to kind of see the location of all the scooters at all times. Um, so if we see like a clump in one area, for example, that would kind of tell our staff, okay, hey, go redistribute these so they're not all piled up. Can I ask a, another legal question? If we made a decision, say a negative decision, uh, how would we defend such a decision? I assume we would need some kind of metric about how, why we feel public safety is threatened by another 250 or 500 scooters. Does that make sense? Whatever number. Well, it's a, yes. I mean, we would need some rational basis for making the decision. That is correct. Rather than just anecdote. Yes. Um, so, so the standard for appeal from a decision of a board or commission mm -hmm. is um, that, that it cannot be arbitrary and capricious, and you must have more than a scintilla of evidence to support your decision. I know that that does not give you a ton of guidance. Um, that is what the case law says. Um, right. Judges interpret that case law their own way, though, so it is <laughs> not that uncommon for a board or commission's decision to be overturned by the circuit or chancery court. Well, I dealt with regulations for a long time in state government, and it's been a while, but I often remember discussions about rational basis. Yes, so, so an articulated... Mm -hmm. um, basis for your decision um, that um, uh, it complies with your overall mission, um, mm -hmm. which is, as Chair said, you know, public safety is kind of your main right. um, criterion um, for guidance, um, uh, is probably, you know, your best defense against um, uh, an adverse deci decision on appeal. Right. But wouldn't you need assuming somebody that used to deal with statistics wouldn't you need some kind of methodology or some kind of metric that you use to make your decision um, I'm not aware of a metric that actually quantifies what more than a scintilla of evidence right. means <laughs> yes. um, yeah. maybe one of those things that a judge says he knows it when he sees it, it or she it, knows yes, it when she sees what, it yeah, that's so. the old thing. I, I guess where I'm coming from is the fact that we have previous statements from Sergeant Bork that that Metro PD does not have the resources to enforce the the rules governing SUMD uh, ridership um, doesn't have the resources to enforce the rules governing SUMDs generally, um, but it's the ridership part that concerns me the most. I mean, already in the ordinance. You know, helmets aren't required, um, but there there is a big problem with them being driven on sidewalks, having multiple people riding the scooters at once, under age driving, um, failure to um, to ride them on the on the streets and to 
to obey all traffic laws. And that's, that's my biggest concern when you have Metro PD telling us, not, and I understand it's not in today's meeting, but certainly previously in, in, in other meetings telling us that they are unable to enforce these rules. That's, that should be a big flashing red sign to us that we need to carefully think about expansion. I mean, what has changed? Actually, there, there was a revision of the ordinance. Part of the language that Ms. Costanos was sharing was actually passed in March. The hearing was in January, so there was additional guidance from the council. Okay. The, the only second. thing that I see that's been changed is the D2 requirement. I mean, the, the, that these criteria apply to B was changed, so that's a bit, little bit of a change. I mean, <coughs> although I, th I thought that they did beforehand, and so did the sponsors of the legislation, um, uh, so, so that was more of a clarification than a change, um, but D2 is new. Um, however, it doesn't seem prohibitive. Just a publicly noticed hearing conducted before the MTLC for purposes of determining public preference regarding increases in SUMD volume. So, so you could ask for expressions of public preference if anyone is here to give those. Well, I remember all of these same concerns coming up in council and in council committees, and they voted for the ordinance anyway. Yeah, and another, <laughs> another thing you can do, which may not seem very powerful, but may have an impact, is that um, you can always make recommendations to the Metropolitan Council to make changes to code provisions um, uh, that you as um, non-council members don't have the authority to change, but, but you know, being kind of the commission with subject matter um, uh, expertise on this issue, um, I, I would certainly hope that they would take that into consideration. I don't know that they want to get into this issue again. <laughs> well, and I, to your point, I don't know that two wrongs make a right, and just because they made this disastrous decision doesn't mean we should follow in their footsteps and continue and, it. And I'm not trying to, I'm not suggesting at all that we as a commission somehow uh, usurp the decision by the council to pass this ordinance. I'm not, that's not what I'm suggesting at all. What I'm suggesting we do is we consider public safety and how this ordinance is implemented. And we all, right now we have Lime, Bird, Lyft, Jump. Is there another company? There are six and a there, seventh application. Okay. so. We know Lime and Bird have a thousand scooters apiece. Mm -hmm. There are 3,750 scooters on, available to go on the, that are approved to be on the street today. So we have 3,750 scooters on the streets right now. And today, between Lyft and Jump, they're asking for another 750, which would bring the total number to 4,500, correct? They're, asking for, they're each asking for a jump 500. from 500 to 1,000. Here's what I see. You know, no, most of the time we are asked to sit, when people are coming in for additional permits, we're asked to wait on the convenience and public necessity. And Metro Council passed this ordinance that approved these SMUDs or SUMDs and set up a criteria for additional units to be put on the streets if they meet this base <coughs> level. And yet, we still are used to the idea of looking at the public safety. Is there a convenience and a necessity for it? Is, it, is there a public safety issue? And, and that's what's made this difficult, because generally speaking, that's our overriding concern before we approve any additional units of anything to be on the streets. But now we've been given this metro ordinance that says we're going to approve these and you can get more in this pilot project if you meet this criteria. And now there's some thought that maybe we don't have to be, have our hands tied to the, approving it because of what's been suggested here today. And, and I, I may owe the commission an apology. I had not, I had always read it to mean that if these criteria were met, then the expansion was basically um, a, a, minist a ministerial approval. Um, uh, 
the chair's reading that he articulated today, um, it made me kind of look at it with new eyes, I think. And when I read it, I do think it's actually ambiguous um, because it does, it says shall require. So the, the expansion shall require. So certainly you cannot have an expansion without at least meeting these three criteria. That is like kind of a minimum floor for the expansion to be granted. But it does not actually say the commission shall grant the expansion mm -hmm. if these three criteria are met. So it's, I, I would say there's an ambiguity there. May I make a suggestion? There's an ambiguity here. I don't like making decisions when there's ambiguous language that may need a little more time to look at and consider. Also, we don't have Sergeant Bork here to put on the record in front of us that the police department cannot uh, regulate them. I know we can incorporate what he said before, but I'd be more comfortable making a, a decision of this magnitude if I had the witness here present to put it on the record so we can say, here's what we found before the commission on that given day, one way or the other. I would give you guys an opportunity. You keep saying to every one of my questions, it's a great question, but let me get back to you on that. I would suggest that you, with your companies, think about some of the things that have been brought up here today. Getting to, to what I'm really get the point I'm trying to get to is maybe we ought to pass this a month so everybody can consider what's been laid out on the table, uh, find out about the ambiguity, get some answers to some of our questions, and get the police up here to actually tell us why or that they cannot do it and why they cannot uh, regulate the scooters. I mean, <clears throat> I guess. Uh, MNPD's already spoken to you. Do you think they're going to say anything different? Occasionally they do. <laughs> <laughs> they said they have before. <laughs> 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 right. And again, is that enough to be defensible? I can't give you I a definitive know. opinion on that. I mean, I we know, will I'm the, the Department of Law will defend you. <laughs> 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 and I can't guarantee we will win. <laughs> And that is not my line. I stole that from one of my colleagues. Well, my personal feeling is, again, you know, the whole arbitrary and capricious part. Second of all, you have to be careful that you're not, you know, substituting your opinion for the council. I listened to most of this. I was involved, you know, in some of the, I went to some of the hearings, as Billy knows. And all of this was discussed. I mean, it's not new. And when they went through the second ordinance, they knew all of this uh, because that's some of the reasons they passed the second ordinance, to fix the first one. And they could have said no, but they voted for it. You know, and as I remember, it's pretty overwhelming. I think even Freddie voted for it the second time because he got the drop dead day. Uh, so that's just my concern about it. You know, I'm not, I don't. I know you will defend us. I don't care whether we win or lose. But uh, being married to a former Metro attorney, I know you've got better things to do. <laughs> so my personal feeling is, uh, let me make a motion. I don't know if we'll get a second, but I'll make a motion. Let's, and then for this month, you want 500, correct? 500 additional scooters. Let's approve 250 this month. Uh, subject to them coming back next month, I'm sure they enjoy their time here. Yeah. So that's my motion. Is there uh, a second? I'm not hearing a second. I, I know one of the your considerations, and I, I think it's a very good one, is to make sh making sure we're not Acting, acting in an arbitrary or capricious manner. Uh, and I understand, just based on the discussion we are having, that I understand the rationale for making a motion to approve 250 as opposed to their request for 500. Uh, it's kind of a uh, split the baby um, um, suggestion, and that's completely rational. Um, but, but we would need a second before we could have a motion on that. Mr. McNally has suggested that we wait a month to get more clarification on uh, the authority we have to act uh, and to decline um, the request uh, by Lyft to have 500 additional SUMDs. 
Um, that's certainly rational as well. Um, so I feel as the chair that any either of those motions are completely rational and would not be at all arbitrary and capricious. It's just been brought to our attention that the sponsor is in the room. Mr. Elrod. Ah, well, well. <laughs> Should I step away? You use the word public. You're fine. If someone when you were describing that ordinance at one time, something about public interest or public concern? Public convenience and necessity? No, the no. last, the last uh, prong. The last prong. Oh, prior. yes, I'm sorry. The, uh, the, um, this is, so there's the three, I'll read the whole thing again so no, you can hear it all in context. I just want to know, what was the public aspect of it? So number D2 was a publicly noticed hearing conducted before the MTLC for the purpose of determining public preference regarding public, increases okay. in SUMD public volume. Public preference. Yes. Yeah, this is anecdotal evidence, <laughs> but if I were to go out on the public, not the users, not the operators, not the companies, and ask the public their preference about increasing the number of scooters. I know my answer four out of five times. I think that. Do you? But your your audience. Well, you're yeah. right. They're your okay. constituents okay. as well. And so. I would read that to mean that the public preference has to be determined at a hearing. Yes. I don't know the public preference here. I know your preference. If there are any members biased. of the public here who are prepared yeah. to speak to this. But the users are part of the public, they are. correct? When you're regulating taxis, you're regulating taxis to protect protect the yeah. taxi rider. Mm -hmm. I wonder and if I'm our... I'm not sure we have to protect scooter riders. I guess actually that is part of the yeah, mission, you. correct? Yeah. yeah. And they pretty obviously was, you know, it's been a long time since I had economics class, but supply and demand has clearly shown there is a public demand for these silly things. That was one of their first compliances. They are, uh, you're, you're exceeding the three yeah. rides per, what, hour? Uh, rides per, per day. scooter per day. Yeah. And again, yeah. that's a standard that the council set. Although you all can change that standard. Okay. You are given the authority to do that. We just never, never have done that today. Okay. Scooters do look silly, higher. as you said. They're a very like funny way to get around. But I would say that Lyft doesn't see them that way. We see them as a really important first mile, last mile solution. That's why we've invested so heavily into them. We don't just do things for fun as a company. We're pretty serious about transportation equity and about sustainability. And so when we operate in a city like Nashville, which is our second home, and we are seeing over four rides per scooter per day, we understand that that is demand that we could only satisfy with more scooters. And as we introduce more scooters, we would of course introduce more compliance staff, um, which is my role. So we take public safety incredibly seriously and um, we do not believe that additional scooters on the street would compromise public safety in Nashville. If we did, we wouldn't do that. What do you have to show that? Um, I think a really good indicator right now is our compliance record so far. So we spoke to you, Sergeant. The compliance record, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the yeah. compliance record, when you say our compliance record so far, you're talking about 80, 50, and 90 of these ordinances right here, correct? The number of people using the scooters per day, the lack of complaints in addressing any issue that comes up within two hours, and the educational components, I mean, when you say the compliance, you're talking about what the Metro Council has required you to do. Um, partly, but I also mean the number of violations that we've gotten from the commission so far, which has been zero. Mm -hmm. um, and we did meet with Sergeant Bork, uh, I don't know if it was a month ago or a little bit longer, but um, we had a really productive discussion with him. We're really excited to partner for the events this week for the draft. And um, he didn't raise concerns to us um, about our record of compliance so far. Have you spoken with anyone in the central precinct, like uh, Commander Howie? I have you not might get personally. A, you might get a different answer. Um, tell me about this. We talked about 20, I think you said 20 complaints in a year. What? Let me, let me, the complaints, this is what would constitute a complaint that you're talking about. 
if there's a violation of Section F of Section 1262050. Permitted operators shall respond to requests for rebalancing, relocation, reports of incorrectly parked SUMDs, or reports of unsafe or inoperable SUMDs by relocating, reparking, or removing SUMDs as appropriate within a two-hour notification between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. If they fail to do that, then it would be a violation. Thus far, on the ones that I have that have come to our office and what we do, we get a complaint, we shoot it straight to the companies as the companies will advise you. And then, and then what we do the best we can is to go out and check the two hour to see if it's been, uh, if it's been handled. If it's been handled, then, then it's not a complaint. I mean, well, it was a complaint, but it's not a violation. Thus far, when we've done the best checking that we could do, for instance, the latest one was for me yesterday, I've been unable to, when I went, they were gone. They, they, that resolved the issue because they were parked inappropriately on the sidewalk. So that's when we talk about 20, that's what we have to find. In terms of what the, what the council has written, that's, that's what we would constitute a violation, for instance. So when I read this and it says total number of riders slash public complaints since December 1,837, what are those? Great question. So those are any, um, that's any negative feedback that we've received about our scooters. So a big chunk of those that we categorize as scooter how-to, that means that a, a user wasn't sure how to use our scooter. So that's a large chunk of the complaints. Um, another chunk of the complaints um, are alleged mechanical problems, which usually when we investigate tend to fall into the scooter how-to. Um, but we categorize those as complaints because we would like our scooters to be as easy to use as possible. And so any negative feedback we wanted to bump in and provide to you so that we were being as transparent as possible. I just, ad addressing my colleagues' complaints here, um, comments here, um, well, I tend to agree with Mr. McNally um, that if we're gonna do anything today, uh, it should probably be to have additional input from interested parties in a public meeting uh, that is well publicized. Um, I, I, I don't agree that just because the council did this or the council heard it twice or they passed it twice uh, that we are either either required or obligated to follow down that path. Um, I remember being at um, one of the early meetings and all of these concerns were raised and the comment that was made was, well, a, a councilman who shall remain aimless wants this done tomorrow. And none of those complaints were addressed at that meeting. None of those complaints, as far as I could see, including public safety concerns, have been addressed. Uh, so I think the best thing we can do uh, if we're going to consider expanding these at all, is to have, as you suggested, Mr. McNally, another um, public hearing to to get that public. What, what were the words you used again? Public preference. Well, it's I, my opinion. I think that Mr. McNally's proposal that we first get clarification on exactly what we can do as a commission and. Um, interpreting and and uh, affecting the rollout of the pilot program I think that's that's obviously of high importance because I certainly don't want us acting as a commission that's beyond our ability to um, interpret and, and promulgate the the ordinance that the City Council passed uh, and again um, w you know by no means am I suggesting we sh we we somehow or you know should act beyond exactly what we're permitted to do under the law um, but I do think the issues are extremely important I do think we need to consider um, public safety I do think we need to figure out how do we implement what the what the City Council wants us to do and, and uh, what are we allowed to to do in terms of, of getting that done. And, um, you know, practically speaking, I mean, this, this whole idea of expansion of scooters 
could could be addressed if we had um, I'm struggling to come up with the right word, but um, commitment by Metropolitan Police Department that they would enforce the, the laws governing SUMDs. And if we did that, I mean, it, it would, in my opinion, have a dramatic effect on compliance. You would have riders knowing that, hey, wow, if I get caught riding on the sidewalk, I'm going to get a ticket. That's going to have a, a, an immediate effect, effect on compliance. And uh, having that, I think, would go a long way to addressing public safety concerns. And uh, having riders, you know, two riders on a scooter at a time or an underage rider on a scooter, all of those that are clearly unlawful under the ordinance, uh, having some enforcement behind them would allow this industry to expand um, and public, the public safety concern be, be addressed. So I, I do think it's important for us to get clarification on exactly what we can and can't do uh, for Metro Legal. I, 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 I certainly did not wish to put uh, Ms. Gastonis or Ms. Ladd on the spot with my interpretation of what we could or couldn't possibly do here today. So. That's why they make the big bucks. So. <laughs> yeah. Could I ask a favor? Uh, Councilman Elrod is here, who's the sponsor of this legislation, and if he's willing, Maybe he could enlighten us about exactly what council did intend. Is that appropriate? And certainly, we can hear from anyone whose opinion may be helpful to you no. if they're willing to speak. He is a politician, so I don't. Put... <laughs> <laughs> well, he's also an elected councilman, so yes. Yeah, so. would, would you, councilman, would you be willing to just speak to the issues that Thank you. Thank we're you debating here? Because <laughs> you've heard most of this, I think. <laughs> uh, my name is Jeremy Orr. I'm District 26 Metro Councilman, uh, and I heard some of it. I came in late to the game, um, so I'll. If, I don't know that I will speak for all. Let's see, we have 30. I have 38 colleagues right now. I can speak for all of them. Um, I couldn't do that during any council meeting, let alone um, when I'm uh, trying to represent all of them. Um, but as a sponsor of the legislation, I think uh, you know my. I guess. I mean, go over my overall intention how it's kind of morphed. My overall intention was to try to, you know, introduce these into si to the city as a pilot project to see if they could work. Um, that, and uh, as an alternative means of getting around town. And, and when it was first passed, I think it was in August, I believe, you know, we're looking, there was, it appeared there'll be two or three, two or three perhaps uh, companies were going to come to Nashville. And then as the fall progressed, it looked like there would be more. I tried to um, attempt in talking with Metro Legal of trying to limit the number of companies, um, but we weren't able to do that uh, legally through many um, different avenues. Um, so, but I think that somewhat the intention was to try to give, uh, you know, somewhat of direction to y'all to, or at least to the commission in general about a certain threshold that they meet this threshold that um, that the companies then can expand. Um, and there, I think there was even some latitude, I think, um, as was expressed by Metro Legal, such as the number of rides per day, that that was a threshold, but it can be changed by, by y'all at your discretion if you want to. Um, you know, but however, I, I certainly understand the concerns, the public safety concerns that many of y'all felt. You know, I myself, you know, the last two instances I've told somebody to stay off the sidewalks, you know, one of them said, oh, yeah, thanks, by the way. I, almost like they forgot. And the next time they said, oh, really? And sarcastically, like, I didn't know that, but I'm still almost ran into you. Um, so I certainly, uh, all of the public safety concerns I understand, and nearly all of them are valid. Um, however, you know, we did uh, uh, set a sunset of this uh, in April. And, and this is just me personally, I'm not speaking for all of my colleagues. You know, my hope is to try to get as much data as possible. We're collecting a lot of data through, from the companies to see if they can work. Um, and there will be a report that is due back to the council in July to see if there need to be more substantive changes. You know, part of my uh, frustration with this, I think, is if you, as you've mentioned, is enforcement and the fact that there isn't really um, any active enforcement going on. And I know that's been something that uh, several council members, Councilman O'Connell, um, we've been um, specifically uh, council, uh, council member uh, Weiner has been trying to find, you know, ways to perhaps fund some um, specific enforcement positions, because I think that's one of the, the probably biggest thing that's lacking in the pilot project. And we don't have a great way of uh, uh, tackling that, um, to be candid. So um, 
I, you know, I, I, that's not a clear answer, I think, Carrie, what you were looking for. Um, you know, I'd like to see these work as best as possible. And I think, you know, the company, all the companies, most of the companies had different models, uh, business models and different types of products. You know, I've heard varying of opinions of which one is best. But, you know, my hope is that we try to see if they can work, you know, with different models and there are other cities that have RFPs. That might be a way we can limit it in the future. Um, but I think, you know, that at least at the time it was written, I think it was the threshold. Once you meet the threshold, um, then you, the expansion then um, kicks in. However, I think we intended to, in the second ordinance that we passed, to try to give you all some more discretion on where to set that threshold. Um, so I don't know if that answers any questions. Yes, sir. Threshold would trigger the expansion, that the expansion would happen as long as they met the threshold, or was there the intent that the threshold was a presumption for expansion and allowing us to take other considerations, to take other factors into consideration like public safety or whether the police department can um, enforce the law in this, in this city? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, sure. Was it going to automatically happen if they met the threshold, or was it a presumption that there would be expansion if they met the threshold with us taking other factors in the public's interest in consideration? Um, I, th I think at least at the time of the original, there were, you know, there were two ordinances. The first one, I think for sure it was that there, you know, once they pass the threshold, it's almost an automatic kick in that it does happen. So, um, the, so the first time it was if they met the threshold, it would be automatic kick in, they could then expand. And that was what we were considering with the first people, the first companies that came in for their expansions. Yes, and the, uh, okay. and the second ordinance, you know, I think we, that I can think off the top of my head, you know, the two things like Terry mentioned is um, we changed the chalk and change the threshold of number of, uh, well, the number of um, rides per day and um, requiring, thank you, the, um, the um, public hearing be held as a public preference, um, but we didn't necessarily, I don't think that necessarily got into whether or not there was enough police officers uh, to enforce it or not. So, um, the, so the, the intention of the second legislation was to give us a little more authority to revise the threshold, but not necessarily to take other factors that, that weren't set out as the, as the factors for consideration in the threshold. I, I believe so, although we, um, I forget how it's worded. I, I think she mentioned it, um, uh, the public preference hearing, um, so, uh, you know, I, I think there is to try to give y'all more discretion, um, but still, in, uh, for the most part, keep that threshold in place. Um, but, you know, at least, again, my intention was y'all are ones that meet, you know, monthly. We're uh, a body that makes every two weeks and, uh, you know, it takes three readings to get a resolution passed. And I tried to have a simple ordinance uh, just to limit the number of companies and, you um, make sure anybody under 18 can't ride it, and it took, what, three, four months to get it through um, and morphed into a lot more than that. So you know, my hope was that to give y'all, you know, y'all are, I guess, the month-to-month -month body that governs these, um, and the council gives direction. If we weren't clear in that direction, then obviously, you know, we'll, we can clean that up if, if we can, although, candidly, we're not as bad as Congress, but I think we're a lot better than Congress. But we'll, we'll, I think we can at least do it, and, you know, but we've, at minimum, it'll still take us a month and a half to do it because of our uh, uh, ordinance process. Um, so I, I think, I guess to sum up, it was to keep the threshold in place, but give y'all some more latitude, um, for instance, in the number of rides per day, number of violations that y'all can set, because that's why, you know, at least when I put it in the ordinance, they give y'all the ability to change that. And if it looks like there's, you know, you know, how, whatever may be going on on the ground. Um, but I think enforcement is something we're going to fight on this no matter what. You know, whether there's 10 on the street or, you know, you know 10,000 or whatever, which I hope it doesn't get to that number. <laughs> but I, I also want to, I, I don't think it cannot be unrecognized, you know, there's a demand for these, that the, no matter the frustration that we have um, with them, I think we all do, of uh, them riding on the street, or excuse me, riding on the sidewalk and up the street and parking improperly on the sidewalk, there is a demand for getting around the city besides a car. And I think particularly not just with the draft this weekend, but with other events and just regular old traffic congestion trying to get home or trying to get across town, people want a different way of getting around town. And, you know, I think it's all, you know, it's, it's the operator's, you know, responsibility to put them out properly in the morning. It's the rider's responsibility to ride them correctly, to park them correctly. And I think it's also important for Metro to enforce it 
to provide, you know, preferred parking areas, perhaps no parking areas where appropriate. And some of those we've got requirements in the ordinance that would uh, require reports to the council so that we can have some of those steps, you know, see, that, see if they're being met. On the enforcement piece, uh, you know, I've got speeding in my neighborhoods and if I, if I had a way to enforce that every day, uh, if I knew a way to get the police department to enforce that every day, I'd do it, um, but I don't. So I, I feel the frustration on, you know, scooters, speeding and a lot of other things, so. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. You got another person up. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Chairman, Jamie Holland. I represent Uber, but I thought I'm also a lawyer, and I thought it might be important now before any motion gets made to kick this can down the road a little bit if I could speak for just a moment. And not from a technical operation standpoint, but just kind of a where we are situation for context. And, you know, according to various media accounts with the NFL draft in town, we're gonna have 100,000 people extra per day in this certain downtown area for three days in a row. And by contrast in the city of Atlanta, when they had the Super Bowl, it's kind of the same situation. The city of Atlanta uh, gave all the operators permits for a thousand, each one per thousand, because moving that many amount of people in that confined space, you need every option on the table instead of limiting options. And, you know, I'm not sure how much Lyft wanted to get today or what, but, you know, we're asking for 250. And so, sorry. Um, going back to kind of where we are as far as a posture is concerned, you know, this commission, for the purposes of, you know, a potential lawsuit and a writ of certiorari in Chancery Court, this commission is the metropolitan government. And so the basis to defer, vote down, what have you, being that the police department doesn't want to enforce the law for whatever reason. Now, I don't know if it matters. But that's not, while the police department may not answer to the Transportation and License Commission, it's also the metropolitan government. And I don't see any rational basis or a scintilla to say that because the government doesn't want to impose or enforce its laws, that that's the justification to deny an application for an expansion that's very limited. And while Ms. Castona says 12.620208 says the MTLC is authorized to promulgate regulations to interpret and administer this chapter, I haven't seen them. I'm not sure if they exist or not. They, they may or may not, but I, I certainly haven't seen them. And the, the limitations of that ordinance, despite the public safety component of this body, which I 100% agree with, I'm not disparaging that at all, but there's no evidence that public safety is damaged by the, not only the existing permitted somedies, but any one more additional, what's the risk to public safety? And it can't be the basis that the government doesn't want to enforce its laws because in the end, that's prosecutorial discretion, not only the police department, but also the district attorney. You know, they have that discretion. Do they want to, is it worth their time to prosecute this person and get collect whatever it can out of this person? They make that decision every day uh, with drug laws, driving on the street, run the red light, you know, things that would might come under the purview of this body, they make that decision every single day. And that shouldn't be, that burden shouldn't be borne by a couple some D operators. And pinning your questions, that's all I have on that until my client comes to speak, if you'll allow them to. Uh, <laughs> what I would ask, I guess, is a kind of, intermediate solution in light of the historical nature of this week is, you know, agree to the expansion of 250 for two weeks a month, whenever we can meet again, a one week, whatever the case may be, instead of a, a straight shot down or 30 days until we have to come back. Well, that, that's actually what I was going to propose out there. And again, I'm, I'm only the chair. I can't make motions, Mr. Hall, sure. but, but, um, Obviously, there's going to be a tremendous amount of people downtown this weekend. Um, 
and a lot of pedestrians, uh, but also I imagine a huge demand for scooters. But certainly we could consider a temporary expansion uh, for the weekend or for a week and then get the further clarification that we're looking for on exactly what we can and can't do uh, with respect to the expansion under the under the rules under the ordinance and whether or not whether or not this commission has the authority to decide um, public safety issues I think we do have that discretion um, and part of that consideration does it does we do need to consider the ability of our government to enforce the, the laws and uh, I mean we're we're you know we're governed by laws and uh, if if we decide as a commission that we don't have the resources to enforce the laws on the books then I I, I think we as a commission can can decide no well then let's put the brakes on expansion but that's why I want clarification because uh, I don't want to do anything that you know Chancery Court will reverse and say no you absolutely can't do that uh, I would like some guidance and then when we get that guidance then we can make a decision and if 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 you want to do a writ of certiorari then then you have a better record um, but I also understand your very practical economic concern that we're about to have thousands of people downtown all wanting to ride scooters and uh, we should consider that too. So. I'm fairly offended by your comment not once, not twice, not three times, but four separate times that Metro Police doesn't want to enforce the scooters. I don't think it's a question of doesn't want at all. So I, I resent that little on behalf of the police department that they don't want to enforce the law. I think it's a question of manpower and ability and a whole host of other things um, that need to be thought about and unfortunately haven't been thought about enough. Uh, so, so I just want to say that. I also think that, you know, the idea that we need a thousand more scooters downtown for the NFL draft because there are going to be a hundred thousand more people down there. I mean, the I mean, the the area is what? How big is the area that we're that we're talking about where the draft acti activities are going to be? This is I not don't know. I didn't suggest a thousand more scooters. However many it is between all of you, but I mean, if you're going to take my words out of context, it would help when talking back that you get mine correct. Okay, well, <coughs> 150 scooters. I don't think we need one more. So. There you have it, but I did not take out of context your comment four times that the Metro Police don't want to enforce the law. I think that's just simply false and, you know, not an appropriate thing to say. Um, but, you know, I think these are more of, I think you're talking about more of a transport, you know, this isn't as much a transportation issue as it is a transportainment issue. So, and that's just my opinion. I agree with the chair that we absolutely have the ability to, um, I think, uh, look at public safety and regulate public safety, and, and that should be on the forefront of our minds, and I think it is. Um, so. What are you guys thinking? I've got uh, just another little thought to, to add into there. Um, I have heard and seen most of the people who are working downtown and many other folks are going to vacate downtown Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, which would suggest that there'll be fewer cars actually on the streets, which is my biggest concern between the scooters and the cars and the accidents that happen. If we were to entertain the idea of a temporary, uh, adding, adding some scooters temporarily, it's not the right way to say it, but uh, to, to add some on a temporary basis, with the realization that most folks working downtown, um, there'll be less traffic on the on the streets, then maybe uh, we we could uh, could do this while also taking consideration public safety. 
and my thought is that there'll be fewer people driving in and out of downtown Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The scooters might be able to get on the street and off the sidewalks, um, and maybe on a temporary basis we could increase them to meet the needs for some people that might want to go from the venue down at Lower Broadway up to the Puckett's restaurant or some other places. Anniversary, and we also need to consider the roads that will be closed for that as well. Oh, yeah, to stop yeah. in about the yeah. NFL draft <laughs> that it is. 30,000 runners come in for that as well. <laughs> so there'll be a lot less traffic mm -hmm. downtown because there'll be roads <laughs> closed, which probably incur which would promote the scooters to go on the sidewalks. So. And it's, it's, it's a real balance here today. publicized, but I, like you, Commissioner McNally, I, you know, I've heard from many people, and I can think of one that enjoys the scooters, one local person, <laughs> and everybody else, it's pretty much, I hate them. <laughs> you, know, you know, they're in the way, they're this, they're that, but obviously there is a usership, and people, obviously people are using them, but I would like to get more public comments about it other than just the operators who are wanting to expand their fleet. Um, so I'm with you. I, I would consider, you know, allowing more for this next weekend, you know, because of the additional people and tourists that will be in the area that might want to use them. Um, but I would like more information, you know, from the public as well as from legal about what we are able to do. Well, I, I think that I'll make a practical suggestion then. I, I think that uh, we ought to consider granting both. Uh, I know we have not gotten to the public hearing on jump, but I, I think if we address it this way, we wouldn't have to have a hearing today for jump. We, we would literally be having it next month. But if we granted on a temporary basis both requests, for expansion um, for purposes of this weekend um, that would address their immediate concern of being able to operate additional SUMDs for the NFL draft uh, but then we could come back next month and better address the, the, the bigger question of permanent expansion for the remainder of the pilot program. And those numbers are Lyft is asking for 500. Yes. And Uber jump, 250 and, and jump, jump 250. Or well, 500? jump is Uber for 500. Okay. No, it's 750 it's total. Jump, Uber only. Okay. So it's Thank 500 you. for Lyft and 250, 250 for, for, okay. for for jump. What do you think? Uh, Thursday through. What's if, if we were to do it on a temporary basis? What is what's the time frame? Thursday through Monday. Folks? I mean, pretty much everything on Saturday, so I think Monday would be more than fair. Or Sunday but evening. But are some of these people going to stick around in town? I hope not, but <laughs> I mean. <laughs> well, that's why I think Monday is more than fair. <laughs> we can't regulate that, that's for sure. How about two weeks? Is that, or a week? I mean, <clears throat> I don't know anything about their operation and don't care, but. You know, it might be harder to staff up and staff right. down. Than Why don't we just say Wednesday through next Tuesday? All right. I, I don't want to give them too much of a lease to go on. So. All right, I make a motion that we will approve the expansion of 500 for Lyft and 250 for Uber from Wednesday the 24th through Tuesday, was that the 30th? April 30th? From uh, noon to noon. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? Nay. <laughs> All right, motion passes. Um, and yes. yes. I would ask that we would put it 
Do we want to have this back on our next meeting? Or to, actually, let's, how much time we have to give for the public hearing and to disseminate the public notice? Um, so there's not a um, clear cut like number of days. The case law speaks to adequate notice. Okay. Um, so there's been, um, it's kind of a standard rule of thumb to do like a week or 10 days roughly in the, among Metro commissions. That's probably more than is technically legally required um, to kind of meet um, uh, minimum um, Open Meetings Act requirements. Um, so next meeting would be okay? Yes. Mr. Fields, would that be practical? Would, would that work for you? Well, from a notice standpoint, would it work? Sorry. And okay. the, rule I think says, the rule says, y'all know the rule. Actually, the the, 10 or 15 days. We, we close the agenda 15 days prior to the meeting. Okay. Okay. We then, uh, typically, we're putting it on the websites seven days. The week before the meeting on Thursday, we're placing on the, on the yeah. website the Wednesday and, and or Thursday. And it is required that you, the, the fri Friday preceding the meeting, you put it on the website. Okay. So I'd asked if we could put the... Uh, expansion issue for SUMDs back on the next meeting. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. All right. You want to move that? Regularly scheduled meeting or is it a special meeting or what? It's, a, it's our regularly scheduled meeting for May. <coughs> All right. Thank you. Parking pilot. Yeah, that probably makes sense. Yeah. And then, Mr. Fields, you want to? Say you, I'm not sure. I think you're kind of headed toward maybe okay. deferring that as well. I would make a recommendation that we defer the next two agenda items onto the May meeting because uh, we're Actually. we're starting to run out of time. So. Just to speak to that, um, yeah. there was a 60-day period in the ordinance for the initial determination to be made as to those two categories of items, and that um, will expire before your May meeting. All right. I, th I think, actually, they'll, they'll move pretty quickly. Okay. Again, I think the issue becomes how much you want to talk about them. The, the first issue... Uh, okay, so uh, I got it. Derek uh, Haggerty is here as an engineer from Tr Public Works. He and the Public Works Department, along with Trent, along with Planning Department, as well as our office, have been working for several months on trying to figure out how could we create crowds. He's going to make a very brief presentation. Uh, the companies are generally aware of it. There have been no pushback, and that I'm aware of anyway. So if Derek would have an opportunity, I think you would see that we could. It may actually help some of the problems that we're discussing today. Derek? And All right, Field, I promise I'm I'll sorry. be quick. All right, and if you'll just hold up a minute, I just want to announce I've, I've got to leave, um, but Mr. McNally is going to take over as vice chair for the remainder of the meeting. All right, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Right. Sure. What, what's coming around is actually you've already had it in your packet, but it'll be something for you to refer to with a map. All right, just to introduce myself again, my name is Derek Hagerty with Nashville Public Works and our Division of Transportation. And here I'm just here today to talk about uh, scooter corrals. Uh, essentially, let me make sure I get this correct here. The, uh, or the council ordinance that we were just talking about, Amendment 2 to the Second Substitute Ordinance Number Bravo Lima 2018-1441, uh, Tasks the Department of Public Works with establishing a program of assigning and marking a limited number of street parking spaces, small sections of sidewalks, areas adjacent to transit stops, and any other right of way as dedicated and preferred parking areas where SUMDs can park without penalty as long as they're properly parked and upright. So, what you have there is our pilot program for this parking program. Uh, essentially, we identified 12 8 by 20 foot parking spaces that are currently not being used in the downtown area. So these are areas that are currently no parking. It's not affecting any existing street parking, any metro bus stops, uh, any valet loading zones, things of that nature. Essentially, we went after the lowest hanging fruit. 
Uh, so we've identified these 12 spots. And on the second page there, that memorandum that's been passed around, you can see it laid out. Some are within, some are just around what we are calling a restricted parking zone, which runs from 2nd to 4th Avenue and then Union to Demumbrium. So we targeted a small area so we can test this program out before we look at expanding it, taking away or repurposing existing parking spaces, uh, things of that nature. Yep. So we're hoping by starting small, we can work out any kinks in the process and uh, get this right before we expand it if we deem that's necessary. And then last thing I just want to discuss, page three of that is uh, just a detail of the crowd design. These also are intended for bike, bicycle parking. There'll be a few bike racks in there so people can lock up their bikes. All of these will be on the street, eight feet wide, 20 feet long, uh, same as a typical parking space. And there will be bollards around them to protect uh, both the vehicles within them or the SUMDs, bicycles, and any pedestrians in that area. And also to keep uh, cars from using them as parking spaces. But that is just a quick rundown of this program here. Uh, you know, at this point, I'll turn it over to any questions. Setting these uh, parking corrals up. Yeah, so I believe, I don't want to speak on this bill if you know this better than I do, but I believe the mayor's office has set aside funding for this program. It'll be a, it'll be a general funding and we'll, we'll cover it. To see it again as a part of the pilot, see if it works. If, if, this, if this is satisfactory and we get the kind of results, then clearly we could be coming back in for, for expansion. Why aren't the uh, companies paying for it? Well, it'll be coming at the money that comes in from the companies. Each company pays, as you know, uh, if you have a thousand scooters, you're going to be paying uh, seventeen thousand five hundred dollars. So, mm -hmm. if assuming all the companies paid their full amount, it's about two hundred eighty thousand dollars over a year's period. So, the money that's being generated in the general fund would clearly cover the pain, the little bit of pain and or striping and the minor uh, issues. And that's also part of the study that we're going to have to be doing is determine should those fees actually go up if uh, even during the pilot program that would be recommending that we may or may not be recommending that kind of thing back to the council. Any negatives to this uh, pilot program for the parking corrals that you've seen? No, and obviously we haven't wrote, brought this program out yet, but comparing to what we've seen in other cities, our corrals are going to be much larger than what's generally available around the country. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that encourages more of these SUMDs to end up within them. Uh, just for comparison, an 8 by 12 space, which we've seen in other cities, can hold roughly 60 of these. So by going 8 to 20, we're hoping we can get about 100 in there. Obviously, that's parked pretty close together, and any bicycles in there will cut down on that a little bit, but uh, yeah, definitely a lot of capacity in the downtown area. And best case scenario, these are overflowing. I can bring that to traffic and parking and say, hey, we need more space. And I do have to admit, when Derek shared that with me, I said 100, <laughs> uh, and he says, Billy, that was just a sheer measurement. We don't anticipate that number. Right. <laughs> Is there a time frame on when you're going to implement this? Did I miss it? You know, so we had uh, from the, we had until May 5th to begin implementation. Uh, we are going to have discussions with council and the mayor's office to see how they want us to proceed. Uh, essentially, we'll be presenting this by that May 5th deadline and then working off any feedback going forward. Does TNT approve this or do they have to? Yeah. I don't believe so. It's a, because it's a pilot. The, we, within the authority, the department can do small plans like this. What do you need from the commission? More of ex, ex, we it needed to come. The commission needs to send this to the council. Is my impression correct? Um, so on this one, the the identification of the corrals, um, it does actually say that the Department of Public Works um, can do that. Um, and has the obligation to implement an initial phase of this program no later than 60 days. However, there's a second um, provision that says, um, that speaks to areas where we don't want scooters to be parked. It says, Metro through the MTLC um, shall uh, determine certain block faces or areas where free floating SUMD parking is prohibited. Geofenced areas may be used to designate where SUMD parking is or is not allowed. The MTLC shall issue its initial determinations no later than 60 days from the enactment date of this ordinance 
and report them to the Metropolitan Council. That has that same May 5th deadline. So you all either need to do that today or we have to set a specially called meeting before May 5th. So uh, what you need from the commission today is a recommendation for or against it? Um, so what um, uh, Derek is presenting, I think actually you don't need to make a recommendation on because it, the, the ordinance gives Public Works the authority to do that. Um, you can. Okay. Um, I, think what, I think what we were doing is basically seeking your guidance to, uh, to, uh, to implement it based on what the ordinance said. I don't know that you have to do that, but... It, but on the other aspect of which ones you want to prohibit parking on, you all do have to that, consider yeah, so, that. Too. So our understanding was Department of Public Works is identifying the locations for these corrals. The commission is approving that restricted parking zone from Demumbrium to Union, second to fourth. So we can, can, we can say within this uh, area, there is to be no parking except in a corral. Can we do that? Do we have that authority? Correct. It says you can determine certain block faces or areas where free-floating SUMD parking is prohibited. Yeah. Okay, so I can make the motion that we prohibit parking in this area uh, anywhere except in the uh, corrals. Does that make sense? Did I say that properly? That you would be designating all areas not located in a corral as um, block restricted. spaces or areas where free-floating SUMD parking within is prohibited. Within this pink square, within, this within the pilot area. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I had one quick question before we yeah. move on to a motion. Uh, on some of these, it looks like they're pretty tight on the corner, and it may just be the way it's pointing no. to it. Um, right. My concern are buses, because I know on second, off at Demombre, and that's a pretty tight Yes. Turn, and is that an impact for that? No. So, great question. Uh, most of these corners, we did put up video cameras doing surveillance 24 to 48 hours to identify any potential issues. So, our original list had 24 parking spots. So we've come down quite a bit based on those. But we believe these ones here, based on what we've seen, what we have data on, there will not be any issues. making them aesthetically pleasing or will they not be? I mean, essentially what are they we're... What look like? Right, so if we go to page three there, all you're gonna see on the ground, it's gonna be a white box. We're hoping to have these uh, SUMD and bike logos imprinted on there, and that's just gonna be white bollards around. So it's gonna be very... Uh, yes, that's, that's a great way to describe it, minimalistic. Right. <laughs> I don't think I'm allowed to make a second anymore. So. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 I ain't allowed to vote, right? Except to break a tie unless you want oh, to voice your opinion. Okay. If you want to voice your opinion, we've yes. been through that. I've, so. I've given my opinion. Sorry. <laughs> may, may we seek clarification? With the motion um, to prohibit parking in any locations other than in the corrals, which Mr. Haggerty presented in the area shown in his materials. That was my intention with the motion. Yes. And hopefully, this will. I mean, if this works, hopefully it'll expand to the rest of downtown. The one reason, the, the initial, when we first started looking, we we laid the Davis County map on the table and we said, where should we put them? And then we thought, oh my gosh, that's a lot. Why don't? And, and then, rightly so, Derek and uh, Jeff Hammond both said, why don't we look at a pilot program, and uh, which does make sense. And uh, so we will pilot this, or they will, you know. And we're going to be working with enforcement, both our staff and traffic and parking staff, to to try to monitor this. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some cameras out and everything else, trying to see to to try to get this to work. And the companies are aware of. They're aware on. of it. They'll be made more aware of it, and before it goes into effect, we will have a one-on-one. -on -one, we'll have a group meeting again to go through it. Okay. Is that all you need from us on that mm -hmm. issue or agenda? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fields. Review of the smud geofencing recommendations. The um, you want to. Ms. Costone has shared with you. We're also directed. I think that, that you just addressed it, <laughs> but but the, I'll let Mr. The, Fields continue. The geofencing. I mean, that's. 
I thought that that was some, sort of the same thing. But. Well, it is. It, it's generally speaking the same sort of thing. The council asked us to, uh, within 60 days of the implementation of that or the ordinance, that we would oh, identify we would identify areas that uh, there would be where parking would be prohibited. They uh, just did that. Hmm? They just did that. But you mean the areas where slowing would be required? Well, what we wanted to do was continue the conversation about additional areas, including the Vanderbilt part of the Vanderbilt campus and that particular issue. Oh, yes. So in, in addition to the area that you all just designated, there may be some additional areas where the Public Works Department would ask you to, um, uh, to limit parking of SUMDs. Well, what you have before you, in your packet, you will see a, uh, a map that was a geofenced area suggestion by the Vanderbilt, uh, Vanderbilt University Medical Center. The, uh, the, they have representatives here, so what we'd like to do is have a public hearing and talk about geofencing in general, uh, because in order to do this, you're going to need to adopt it and other areas we would suggest. So basically what we'd like to do is have a, a, a pr probably a brief public hearing to let them uh, describe what they want done and, and how they'd like to do it. Mayor Pat Teague. Oh, sure. Thank you. My name is Mary Pat Teague. I'm here representing Vanderbilt University and Vanderbilt University Medical Center today. Um, and first, thank you because I know this has been a long afternoon for all of you. Um, um, the university is very supportive of the scooters, and actually we have gone out of our way to um, encourage scooters on our campus as an alternative form of transportation. And we've set up contracts with a couple of the companies, sort of additional layer of things that we needed to make it function on our campus. And it's gone well. Um, but despite having some signage and education, there are some issues that we have. Um, one of it is we have a high number of pedestrians on our campus. And it's basically a walking campus. And there's consider concerns for some ADA issues and accessibility, especially at the medical center where we have patients oftentimes who will come out of um, their hospital room if they get an opportunity, possibly in a wheelchair or with an IV pole. And so they, there has been issues with um, entrances have been blocked. So what we have talked to is we had a meeting with Mr. Fields and Ms. Castonis, and we came up with, with um, geofencing part of the campus. And that, um, that's the map you have there in front of you. And that map shows, in addition to all the yellow spots would be geofenced, and then the, the numbered spots along there would be where we'll put up additional parking. Because we do want to encourage this and, and have an opportunity for people to do the right thing. Um, do you, Mr. Mitt, you don't have that? Is this the map? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's not in it's color. Not in color. Okay. So, okay. Um, Are the dots the yellow that yeah. you're referring to? Okay. Wonderful. I can hold it out here for everybody to see. So in the geofenced areas, what we initially requested was that the, the scooters wouldn't operate in those areas, especially on the plaza there, that big yellow um, area. Um, I understand that maybe what they're talking about, to talk to Mr. Fields, is that the, in that area, the um, speed limit would be reduced to two or three miles per hour, which basically means that they'd have to walk it through that area, um, which would be acceptable to us. And then the other thing would be um, that you would not be able to end a trip in there. So that would also kind of discourage people for coming in there and um, leaving a scooter at random someplace, because they would still be charged if it, they can't end the trip. And we designated parking areas outside of all the geofenced areas. In addition to that plaza, and there's a couple pedestrian bridges that we have over 21st Avenue. Um, so that really is the gist of it. We just are trying to make this work on our campus, um, given that we have a lot of different needs and um, um, with different people having different accessibility issues and um, also at ADA concerns as well. So that's what we're looking for. So the yellow is the geofenced area where they'd be limited in speed to two to yeah. three miles an hour, basically walking it or staying out. And then the dotted, the one through six is for what purpose? Parking places. So parking you can see places. they're all okay. kind of adjacent to the geofenced areas. And in the parking places, is it your intention that that's where they will drop the 
SUMD. Right. We already have parking designated on the mm -hmm. campus. Basically, we've taken places and with paint, simple as that, created spaces. It's not always followed, but we feel like with um, the combination of the fact that you can't get in, you know, leave a, a scooter in the geofenced area, and then that you would be uh, have an opportunity to park on either side of it. And it wouldn't be an inconvenience if you found yourself in the middle of the geofenced area to just backtrack a little bit. It looks like number four, though, is in the middle of a geofence, the big highlighted yellow area. Uh, that would be, yeah, the yeah. University Medical Center. I think Center. that's, yeah, right. And I think that's due to the fact that they feel like that's sort of a high um, area where they have already seen a lot of scooters going through. And so I think they wanted to create that. Now, create a parking spot right. in the middle. And, of but technically, if that may be a problem, we can we can move that. I mean, that's, I guess, up to no, I was just what out technology that allows. Albums right in the middle of your row. Sure. I believe there's a provision. I'm probably not going to be able to find it right off the bat, but I, I believe there's a provision that says that you can put a corral, locate a corral in an area where parking is otherwise generally prohibited. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else, Mr. Fields? Uh, and again, there's a public hearing. If any of the, if anyone would like to address the issue of the jail fencing at Vanderbilt, I also would, I would share with you. There are some other areas that already we call they call red zones or no mm -hmm. drop zones or whatever. For instance, downtown, uh, Fifth Third Bank Plaza is one. The area around the Music City Center is another one. Uh, the, 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 the whole question of, of being able to park on Broadway came up just yet, late yesterday afternoon in a meeting. Uh, of, uh, so I would, almost, I would like to hear from the companies about issues related to scooters parked on the sidewalk from 1st to 7th on Broadway. Well, and, and the other side, for instance, the just for the commission's purposes, any sidewalk that is uh, too small, in other words, I think the, it's got to be. So the language of the ordinance already says that any sidewalk that um, does not have a frontage or furnishing zone or that has a frontage or furnishing zone that is smaller than three feet in width is an area where parking would be prohibited. But because that's maybe a little hard for um, your average user to interpret, um, uh, we had a discussion with some public works staff um, about the fact that the public works specs specify that the pedestrian path of travel um, should be at a minimum five feet wide. Um, you could interpret that any sidewalk that is narrower than eight feet wide five feet plus the three foot either frontage or furnishing zone um, would be an area that would be prohibited for scooter parking. Should we first deal with the Vanderbilt geofencing issue? For you can address all of them individually or collectively however you wish. Yeah, again, some of the, what you just quoted is already in the ordinance. So it's yeah. already it, in the ordinance, so, yeah. but not like if you were to add that to like areas that were yeah. in the red zone, yeah. you know, I think that would be maybe more clear for users and for enforcers in terms of where the scooters cannot be parked. So I think if you could have the public hearing and then we'll can move from there. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Sam Reed with Bird, um, and we have a, a, a wonderful relationship with Vanderbilt. Uh, as Mary Pat said, we we have a a contract with Vanderbilt to have uh, 100 scooters on their campus and, and look forward to working closely with them to implement these areas. Just one note on, on geofencing. Um, the, what you'll see in, in a lot of the apps today when you open them, you'll see areas that are designated as no parking, no ride zones. Um, there, there is the ability for a number of the companies, I, I believe all of the companies, to do what you would call sort of a true geofencing where uh, as Mary Pat was detailing either a scooter would slow down or stop completely for instance part of our plan for this weekend includes just complete no ride zones where we can shut the scooters down um, when we know that they're going to be entering areas that we've been working with Billy and his team and the NFL draft folks to make sure that we're not um, you know getting in the way um, the the uh, what I would say about that is 
it, it wouldn't work in a very small area. Geofencing from the sky has anywhere from a five feet to 15 feet sort of uh, margin of error, right? If you ever tried to get an Uber and it looks like you're standing across the street and the Uber's in some other spot, you can, you can sort of experience the, the issues with geofencing. So we couldn't, for instance, geofence an area like that to require parking or um, not a, an area where you where you couldn't ride. It needs to be a much larger area because you're just naturally going to get those uh, buffer zones on the outside. Uh, Want to look more specifically at the plan, but we'll do everything within our power to make sure we're doing uh, everything to keep those areas clear. So uh, just to a point of clarification that what I think the commission is now considering is no parking areas rather than no ride areas, if I'm understanding correctly. Understood. So um, there is another provision about, um, so there's actually two provisions. The one that I was reading to you before is the one that I think we're discussing right now, which is 1262-040-E2C which says Metro through the MTLC shall determine certain block bases or areas where free floating SUMD parking is prohibited. So that's specific to parking. So you can designate the areas and then the second sentence says geofence areas may be used to designate where <coughs> SUMD parking is or is not allowed. So I think you can prohibit parking in certain areas, but you don't have to use geofencing in all of those areas. Um, the other method of geofencing that I think was referenced before that may work better with parking is where you, the, the SUMD keeps running and charging the customer and it cannot be, um, that's what Mary Pat was referencing, it cannot be turned off basically unless you go out of the red zone and back into a corral or something like that. Um, the, um, the other provision that talks about um, uh, no ride zones is really um, sec or section N um, of 1262-040-050, I'm sorry, 1262-050-N, and that says the MTLC or its staff, so Billy could do it, may establish limitations on the hours of operations of SUMDs, the streets within the metropolitan area which they can or cannot operate, so that's about riding and streets or areas where SUMDs shall be slowed down remotely by the operator. So that's a little bit different than the no park, but you have authority to do both. So we have two kinds of things. We have a geofencing issue. I mean, in other words, there's some that's geofence, some that is basically, you can call it red line, red zone or whatever. So we've, we've made multiple requests from the companies to uh, include areas they could not leave vehicles. For instance, the Music City Center, they could not leave vehicles around the Music City Center. Uh, and, and, and that's, anyway, they're not around the Music City Center, Fifth Third Bank, uh, and some areas like that. Where, again, the Vanderbilt is, is an additional area that uh, we would like to, again, when it can be geofenced, I want to, we would think it should be geofenced. If not, then it should be redlined and not allowing, mechanically, the GPS will not allow that machine to be left in that area. And I don't know if, if Derek is still here, but I would assume that whatever areas that you all designate as no park areas, that a master map could be generated mm -hmm. showing all of those areas simultaneously, whether they're geofenced or not, and that map could be shared with the scooter companies and they could in turn share that information with their users. So are you looking for us today to pick out areas to say no parking? I, I, I am, but I'm basically well, recommending the areas that we've suggested would be the ones we would start with, and there could be additional here, additional meetings. If you choose other areas, you clearly have that authority. The code so I've seen the actually, Vanderbilt area yeah, now. The, now, what other areas are we talking about? Well, I would ask that you would use the, the Music City Center would yeah. be an area. around mm -hmm. The area around the Music City Center is actually operated and owned by the Music City Center, mm -hmm. therefore it makes sense. They do not want scooters there. They're being blocked, and we'd like to continue to do that. Fifth Third Bank and their plaza, there were some riding issues. We'd like for that to be blocked as well. Mm -hmm. um, Broadway. I'm sorry. I, 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 in Broadway, I think there should not be any scooter parking on the sidewalks on Broadway, uh, mostly because we're not allowing anything else to be parked on Broadway uh, in any form or fashion. Too much, too much pedestrian traffic down there. Correct. Too, so. so on the Fifth Third Bank plaza, there's no parking or no riding? No parking or riding. All of these are riding. no parking. 
Oh, well, park, well, parking is what we're looking at at this point. Yeah. And then the other one would be sidewalks less than eight feet in width. And that's basically real. I, I guess what I would say that's reaffirming what we think, what we believe, what's already in the ordinance. Okay. It makes it clearer. Let me see if I go through this agenda real quickly. You're looking for us to approve or recommend no parking at the music, music City Center along Broadway from 1st to 7th, mm -hmm. 5th, 3rd Plaza, mm -hmm. the Vanderbilt University map that's been provided mm -hmm. to us. And any side and any sidewalk that is less than eight feet in width. Correct. Okay. Now, based on been, because yeah. of everything we've heard so far. Yeah. And, and again, that, now. I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say that the um, the code provision does say that's an initial determination. So if you want to add areas to that other uh, other areas to that later, I think you can. Okay. And then for just a little clarification on the Vanderbilt University proposal that's highlighted in yellow. Um, are we saying no parking in that area, or it's a geo-fenced area to, for the, unit, the, the scooters to go slow, to be limited in speed? In addition to the no park, or no ending a ride, which mm -hmm. um, I guess we're talking about now, there is an issue with um, still scooters, if they would travel through a geo-fenced area, and unless we put in their provision that reduces the speed or they shuts the com um, scooter off, which I understand may be a safety issue, so it's better just to reduce the speed, that doesn't help the problem. We'll still have scooters scooting through areas where we have people in wheelchairs um, coming out of the hospital. I mean, they do come out occasionally and get some sunshine and walk around if they're able. So um, that's so why don't we just say no scooters in this area that's in yellow? You can, you can do both. You can that would both that actually no operation and no parking. that would be that would be fine with us. I mean that would actually that was our first choice. I didn't think that that was an option, but that would be the first choice for us. No scooters allowed, and I don't know how you do that. I mean, what what is well, the, what has to be put in place we're in, to prevent that? We're a new that? area for the staff, and and so we're obviously working our ways through this, but we'll we will find additional guidance if need be. To do that, it's we, what you're talking about. It's possible just in talking with a company. So you're, you're in a contract with Berg, right? At Vanderbilt University. So yeah, can't we do you have say, a Berg, okay, yeah. Berg, you're not allowed to be at the University Medical yeah. Center because it endangers patients who are out getting some fresh air. Right, but I think there has to be something to prevent, you know, the random scooter person from, you know, getting on a Bird scooter. Even though Bird says they can't do it, they do it. And in addition to that, we have, there's a couple companies we do not have contracts with, and they're also on our campus. And, um, you know, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, I'm just saying it's just what it is. And so um, I feel we need some kind of um, technological way to prevent that from happening. And if it's a way to control those scooters during that geofenced area by reduction in speed um, or flat out not allowing them, that would be fine, but I feel like just saying that shouldn't be, I don't think, would help too much. Ms. Fields, what hour do we have to be out of here at the latest? Five well, we, we, probably 5.30. We're at a quarter to six. We really need to get through this entire agenda today, and I realize it's a challenge, but we there's some issues here that have been on for months. We really need to finish. I'm a little, I'm still uncertain about the Vanderbilt geofenced area and the request there, but yep. um, thank you. I, I mean, I can reread the provisions in terms of what you're authorized no, to do. No, thank okay. you. Uh, not right now. Let's just see where we are as a commission. Oh. I'm just trying to return to see through the yellow parts that around the medical center as well as that bridge going over 21st that connects Peabody with the main campus. Those are the areas where they would prefer no riding. And Bill, you're saying your staff will have to figure out how to technologically make that well, happen? Well, we will not be the ones figuring it, but we'll be requiring the companies to figure that out. To figure so that out. We're, we, they will so comply with today you. would just be for you to move forward with exactly. making them. Okay. It seems to me that uh, the request from our director about the Music City Center Broadway from 1st to 7th, 5th, 3rd Plaza, and the ordinance regarding 8-foot wide sidewalks, there's probably not much disagreement to those proposals, is it? Yeah, 
Thank you, Mr. Please. I'll make a motion that we recommend no parking around the Music City Center, around their entire building footprint, the Fifth Third Bank Plaza, and on Broadway from First Avenue to Second Avenue, or Seventh Avenue, I'm sorry, and on any sidewalks that have less than an eight foot inches in width. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Vanderbilt now. How does everybody understand this to be? And look, maybe I'll pass this down. On the Vanderbilt, what, what are y'all's thoughts regarding the proposal they have here? And there's a massive yellow area in the middle, and then as the representative from Bird expressed, the geofencing on some of the narrow spots is challenging. I thought he was okay with it. Are you okay with it? The I haven't seen this proposal. I did speak with somebody from Vanderbilt a couple weeks ago and expressed that, you know, and shared some initial information about what the request would be. But I'd love to take a close look at this. And I mean, we have various tools in our toolbox to address a lot of these things, um, committed to making it work. Um, and I just would need to see the details and exactly how small certain areas are and then tailor a solution best to just keep those areas clear. We would also put a bird watcher in that area. I know we have several on their campers. That's our people that are similar to the uh, some of the other companies have that we just go around constantly moving um, uh, birds throughout the day uh, and responding to requests to remove them. We've done that several times in Music City Center and other areas of concern as well. So um, yeah, I mean, we, we would like to do that. We'd like to work with Vanderbilt to implement it in a way that would work best. Um, um, and I, I trust that we'll leave here and go do that. We'd basically bring the companies back together, meet director with Vanderbilt, and resolve the issues. So we table it today? No. Or do we make a motion? Let's, table. Let's pass yeah. it. Okay. We can work it out later. Don't we have to do it today? Didn't you say it before May? <coughs> so it is mandatory so language that you do more. something, yeah. but it oh, says right. it's an yeah. initial determination, so you can add to it later. I move we make an initial determination for the Vanderbilt plan based on this. Is that appropriate? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All those in favor. Is there a second for the motion to make a determination? All right. well, would you consider making a motion? I thought I did. I was trying to. Move to approve. Is that what you were asking? Is yeah, that I'm not sure I understand. By making an initial determination, I think they mean that you are approving? Yes, that's what I was trying to do. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. I was trying to follow the language. Of oh, you're <laughs> okay. Is there a second? And I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Now, to the interesting one. Uh, consideration of making a recommendation to the Metropolitan Council to amend Metropolitan Code to authorize the Commission to discipline a certificate holder, license holder, permit holder for providing false testimony or documentation to the Commission or the TLC staff. I think this came up after Metro evaluated whether we could take action against someone who had falsely testified before us. Uh, if you have a public hearing, then you would if, if, if you so, so chose, yep. you, we would then uh, make a recommendation to the council for changes to the ordinance. Is there anybody here that wants to speak as to this particular issue on, or this particular part of the agenda? Yes? I mean, we're obviously, in, I don't know if there has to be someone to give you evidence to make a decision in favor of making the recommendation, so if so, that's what this is. We're in favor of there being some kind of enforcement mechanism in place for someone who lies to the commission, obviously. Whether that's a fine or suspension of some kind, I think there has to be, you know, some incentive to tell the truth here. As you all know, these debates get pretty acrimonious, and so I'm trying to keep them as close to on the rails as possible in every way we possibly can, so. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. No one else showing an interest in speaking. We'll close the public hearing. Is there any deliberation, debate? Not hearing any, so a motion. 
what we would be asking you to do is make a motion that would authorize staff and legal, mostly legal, to develop language to recommend to council to fit into the appropriate section of the Metropolitan Code. Is that the way to put it? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Commissioners, I apologize, but Vanderbilt has asked for a clarification on the prior motion as to whether um, the approval of the zone that they requested <coughs> includes both um, no parking and the slowing down of rides going through there. I'll move the motion. Take your map as it yeah. was presented to so us. So as requested, the, the, the well, request is want. granted. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, thank you very much. I apologize. Their problem. Okay, um, low speed vehicles review of the application from Daniel Medley. Mr. Medley, Daniel Medley, are you present? Mr. Medley is not present. Uh, is this the first time it's up? Yes. Uh, second? Any second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Review the driver application for John B. Marshall. What's going on with Mr. Marshall, Mr. Fields? Uh, or is he present? Actually, there's Mr. Mr. Marshall is here, and there's one more that you may have an agenda. Of. I'll have one more after this. Okay. In making his application, Mr. Marshall, and it's been several years ago, failed to list several charges. The last charge he failed to list was in 1990. I'm sorry, that's not true. I, I apologize. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, it was a 2015 charge of a domestic assault. Mr. Marshall's president to answer. Mr. Marshall. Marshall. Yeah. Well, the only thing I see listed, Mr. Marshall, is uh, was it the speeding ticket, right? Right. Two on the front. Oh, two. Oh, failure to yield. Okay. Failure to yield and crossing the line. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Why'd you fail to list your domestic violence charge? I thought it was expunged. Well, so what was the outcome of it? Uh, nothing. I didn't. I did a uh, uh, anger management class. All right. Well, let's back up a second. You thought it was expunged, so you thought you didn't have to list it. Right. Is that what you're telling me? Yes, sir. I mean, that's what my lawyer told me. He said, don't worry, I'll have this expunged. Now, you, re you read the English language. What's that? You read the English language? Yes, sir. You filled out the application? Yes, sir. And it said very clearly there, list each law violation, whether convicted or not, including expungements. I didn't realize that. Sorry. It says including expungements? Mm -hmm. In yep. bold Underline. I'm sorry. So, 2015, you got charged with domestic violence. Who charged you? My wife. Is she here with you right now? No, sir. Okay. Um, you had a lawyer? Yes, sir. Was in Davidson County? Yes, sir. And the outcome? I did a anger management class. Did you plead guilty? I never even went into court or anything. My lawyer handled it all. He came out and said, okay, you're done. Got a six-month anger management class. And Come it's back with your certificate and it'll get dismissed and expunged, huh? Exactly. How'd you do in the anger management classes? Just fine. Well, you're smiling and saying just fine. I, they're, they're difficult classes, so I know I, know, I really want a sincere was, answer. Well, I mean, uh, it wasn't difficult. I didn't think so. Um, I mean, I went to every class, and I mean, I, I just didn't think it was difficult. It was, there was a few th good things I got out of it. Good. You know. And finally, what was the allegation that your, is it your ex-wife now or your current no, wife? No, my current wife. Current wife. Okay, what was the allegation she made against you in the warrant that charged you, that got you arrested for domestic violence? She claimed I hit her. Did she show up for court? No, sir. Any other questions? 
see the statement here on your application says, do you understand that a false or misleading statement on this application or failure to fully disclose all requested information is a violation and may result in the denial of your application? And you circled yes. Do you remember that? Yes, ma'am. I just, I don't understand. You guys, you come here and you, you, you just fail to put stuff down. And then you say, I don't know, I didn't think I had to. Or, but, but you saw that you had to and you acknowledged that you had to. So do you have a better answer than that as to why just, you didn't list it? I just must not have seen the expungement part or whatever. I mean, and yeah. Just and that's your own, that's your, that, that's all I see other than the speeding violation and the two traffic violations, right? And you haven't been arrested since? No. For anything? No. You realize if you had put it down there, you wouldn't be here today. Yeah. You'd probably already have your, your permit. <laughs> well, I have my permit. Okay. This year's. All right. Some's, okay. Previously, Previously yeah. Like, and there's been several years where you didn't put it down and he got a permit. What was the last time you applied five years? He, he has an 18 permit. The last time he did a background was Would have been 2014. We, we, yeah. we did background checks for a lot of over five years. Okay, because I'm seeing something about 2015, 2016, yeah. 2017. Okay. I, right. I have a question. So you've been driving for how long? Almost five years. Did you get a failure to yield while you were driving? Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. I'm more worried about that. Well, who did you fail to yield to? It was Franklin. And I mean, was it a car? Right another there. car? Or? No, no, no. Um, I was in a car. And I even had a passenger. I pulled up to a red red light, and I was slowing down for the red light, and it turned green, and I went through. And he pulled me over for failure to yield. And okay. even my passenger in the back says, "Officer, it turned green." Okay. So it wasn't a crash; it was just a violation. Right. right. Okay. Right. Right. Mr. Crash. Fields, that would not have kept him from no. getting okay. Any other questions? Did you say that he had previously failed to disclose something as well? Is it, is no, I heard you he, say? he did. Yeah. I was looking at it, but in 2015, he didn't have the arrest at the time he filled out his application. Okay. So when he came renewed, it showed up, and he, on okay. his renewal, he did not fill it out or put it in there. Did, did you learn something from this proceeding? Yes, definitely. Yeah? yeah. What I happens learned, next I time? I learned that my thing is not expunged. But what else? But that I Something else? There next. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is there a motion? I'll move we approve. Set. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We have an additional one. Okay. Uh, Arthur Steve Jackson. Mr. Jackson. I'm making this application, and this one I started earlier, and I apologize. Mr. Jackson, uh, he had several charges he failed to list prior to 1990. Uh, since then, and I'll have to review it again, he could probably answer better. Uh, since 1990, have you had any issues no. in the last many years? No. Mr. Jackson, who's with you here today? This is my boss, Randy. Randy Gaines, I'm general manager of Flyway Parking. What would Mr. Jackson be doing for you? He is a shuttle driver. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Fields, we've got a driving without a license listed as back in the 70s or 80s, but then everything blank from the 90s, huh? Yeah, he, the, the last charge that we're aware of would have been a uh, distribution charge, actually, 1989. But there have been no issues since then. You're a convicted felon? Yes, sir. You got a burglary charge on here? Uh huh. You had a burglary charge at one time? No, sir. No? No. Robert? A lot, a lot of the stuff got to be challenged because I, I didn't even do it. They got murders and everything on there. I, don't, I haven't done that. 
So you're saying a lot of the items that are listed in your Tennessee Bureau investigation background check is somebody else? I never had a burglary or no murders. The rest of it. There's also the charges of the uh, possession with the d intent to distribute cocaine. Is yes, that one yours? Yes, sir. What was the outcome of the case? Well, I went to prison. All right. Possession of a firearm by a convicted person? That was all the same case, yes. All right. I did see the first degree intentional homicide. Yes, that's not Arthur me. Arthur Steve Jackson. Yes, sir. Where were you in March, on uh, March 22nd, 1989? I was on the street, yes. I was questioned, but I was never charged. They told me I had to write back and get it taken off. That's what I was questioned for, but I never went to court or anything. Well, this says you were arrested. For a murder charge? I wasn't arrested for no murder charge. Did you ever get charged with operating a vehicle without the owner's consent? No, sir. There's no disposition. So. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm getting very bad uh, records. Mm -hmm. Straight from what? Tennessee Bureau Investigation. Yeah, exactly. That's not there. But they're continuing to review that. You haven't had anything since 89, so it's changed in your life. Yes. What has changed in your life that you don't appear to have anymore? I don't hang out with the same crowd. I've been saved, going to church, been mentoring people that gets in trouble. And I've been working for the last 11 years. Don't miss any days on time. Have you been working at Flyaway? I've been working here for, I think, about three months now, but I've been working at Nissan for five years now. Prior to that? Yes. You married with a family? I'm married. My kids are grown. I got grandkids. So, l looking at your record, what's the worst convictions you have on your record? Because it's hard to decipher uh, this record. Um, 1989, selling drugs. That's when I went to prison. And how long did you do? 20 years. And how much of that 20 years did you do? 20 years. You did 20 years? Yes, sir. Are you on parole right now? No. I was released early. The judge released me early when I got out. Okay. When did you get released off parole? Um, 08. Okay. Good. Um, you're Gaines. Mr. Gaines? Gaines. That's Gaines. Uh, does it concern you in the least that this gentleman has murder arrests on his record and he says he I was didn't never commit arrested a murder. for murder? I didn't commit a murder. Well, through, through our background check, through our office, he cleared the background check, and I'm not privileged, uh, but this is the first I've heard of that. Um, you know, our office does a thorough background. He cleared the background checks that they do. Um, so this is the first, yes, this is the first I've heard of that. And that came from DBI? It, it did. Mm -hmm. well, again, we can, um, the, the, for instance, the, the charge you were talking about was dismissed. Um, so they, that's the reason he was here today, was we reviewed everything. Most most of the things have been dismissed. Whether or not they should have been on his record to start with, uh, again, I don't know. You may need an attorney, and, and then if you're doing a background, you may want to check your background company. But he can, we can't share this with you. He can share this with you himself. Yeah, I got a copy. And you probably have. So, But for instance, that, that the first-degree murder, the attempt was then reduced to reckless injury, and then it was ended up being dismissed. Uh, in 85. So the most serious that we could yeah, find was what he had suggested like was the yeah. theft of the robbery. I mean, where did these arrests and convictions occur? Well, 89 when I was um, sold the drugs. That was in 89. Where? What county? Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yes. And you never had a robbery conviction? No. June 21st, 1982. 
Oh, the robbery, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm still thinking about the burglary, yes. Well, I, the, the date helps you there, then. Yeah. So, how much time did you serve on the robbery conviction? <clears throat> Probation. What about the theft charge? And on November 25th, 1981, theft charge, looks like it was a retail, maybe a shoplifting. Yes. Remember was, being was convicted of that? Yes, sir. I didn't list none of that because it was so old and I didn't think it goes back that far. You heard us read the question to the gentleman, Mr. Marshall, right before you, right? Yes, sir. Was there any ambiguity in those words about list all convictions? Well, what happened? Rest, I, even once expunged? What happened with me when I read, I was going for to take the fingerprints for the driving at Flyaway. And when I read half of the paragraph, the first thing came up, have you been convicted of driving or anything like that? And after that, I just stopped because I thought it was all talking about just driving the vans. So I didn't read the whole paragraph, which was my fault. In Flyaway, you're one of the airport parking lots, and he drives people from your parking lot to the airport and yes, picks sir, them up at the airport and brings them back? Yes, Off-site? Sir. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that was my fault for not How, reading the whole thing. Has bag, he been right? there with you for a while, or? For three months. And he's been driving? Yes, sir. He's been driving people or just your vehicles around the lot and servicing and so forth? Yes, sir. Which? <laughs> Both. So he's been driving people? Yes, sir. Without the permit? I, I'm assuming I took over the location the first of this month. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes. When I, when I, the actual first day I got there is when the lady from the, the licensing said, hey, nobody's ever did our company as well at, you know, the charge, you know, the money for the licensing for this coming year. So that's how I got involved in all that. That was the same day we took him up there and had him fill out the paperwork and, you know, do the fingerprinting. You transport him to go get the, to go get the paperwork done and everything to get to get in compliance. Yes, sir. That and that. you showed up here today with him. Yes, sir. Why are you doing all that? Why are you doing that? I was informed that I had to be here. It's on the paper that I had to bring a representative from mm -hmm. the job. Okay. And you're saying you did a background check? Our company did, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And it's, you know, as far as I know, it's caught other stuff. So this is kind of, it's a pretty thorough background. Uh, because since I've, there's been two other employees that I've, you know, dismissed because the, they came back as adverse background checks on those. Well, good for you. But, Mr. Fields, this company, so apparently before this fine gentleman came in, we had somebody over there who couldn't have, given a hoot about who was driving or what they were doing. What, who, is this, this is fly away, fly away? Fly yes, ma'am. We, we require, at an annual basis, the company's each required to give us various lists. And then when they add drivers, they obviously have to add. If they, I'm assuming prior to his, uh, prior to his uh, employment, uh, he had been, he was allowed to drive and we weren't aware of it. By the same token, and that's the reason I questioned, was he driving people or cars? In a lot of instances, driving the car without people in it is not a violation. There are companies, and a lot of times what they'll do is they'll bring an employee in, and their only job is to move cars, get cars moved because they're doing the valet and so forth. And that's the reason I questioned, you know, are you certain he was driving passengers? Because flyways actually, I mean, you know, I can't vouch for every move they made, but we've not had any issues that I'm aware of of, of drivers at the flyway not becoming licensed and driving without permission, because there's a lot at stake. Sir, were you driving cars or were you driving people or both? I do both, yes. I, know, I, I have an issue with the company, I think, not not you, sir. I understand, yes ma'am. But what, what? We could certainly ask the company to come in and explain this at the next meeting. And you would have disciplinary act, you would take disciplinary action at that time. So, for him to continue driving, we've got to approve. Correct. Okay, I move we approve. Okay. His license, not the company. <laughs> There's been a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 
sir, you'll be invited to come back next month. To <laughs> Not you, but you, you'll need to be here as a witness. Is, with his testimony that he just gave, is that enough? Does he need to be back next month? Actually, was he poor? No, not. If you'll, we'll, we'll ask you to come back. Both of y'all come back next in month. In general, okay. we have had the practice of only doing the swearing in for the disciplinary hearings, okay. which yeah. this was not. Okay. So he has not testified under oath. That's well, thank you for being honest. Yeah. Okay. Jackson was. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jackson. And if if I could with yes, the next sir. companies, yes. if you wouldn't mind. Uh, you you have in front of you also pastor vehicles for hire. Uh, it, it's a variety of issues. Uh, You're good, Mr. Jackson. <laughs> uh, we have uh, review company applications, one for Grand Avenue, one for H and J Motoring. You have review changes of address applications for Accurate Service, Advent Transportation, Azimi Livery, uh, Black uh, Jaguar, uh, k and Transportation Service, Nano Limo, Nash Limo, McDougal Transportation, Sam's. You've also got a <laughs> request for modifying ownership of Music City Sedan. You also have name changes for Southern Luxury to Southern Luxury Transportation, Excelsior Transportation to Excelsior Service, Nashville Marriages LLC to NM Transportation. Those are all applications that are all are in order. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Fields. I was hoping you would agree. <laughs> Always hoping to your guidance. In your in your initial uh, agenda, yes. We have uh, we, there were three disciplinary issues. Two of them will need to be moved to next month. Uh, there was. The, the first two will need to go to next month. The last one with nan National Animal Advocacy against Southern Comfort Carriages. Everybody's present. All right, if the witnesses come forward and be sworn, please. And you do not need a motion to move the other two to next month, do you? Okay. Everybody who's going to testify, please raise your right hand. And repeat after me. I swear or affirm. I swear or affirm. That the testimony that I am about to give the testimony I'm about to give is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. All right, and whenever anybody testifies or speaks to us, please introduce yourself. Now I know why counselor wanted to uh, make it a criminal offense for uh, giving false testimony to this uh, Honesty is the best policy. In our, it's our position. Yeah. I've yeah. got, <laughs> if you want to distribute these, I mean, all right, and this is, Tuesday you are with Nashville Animal Advocacy. That's right, Joshua um, I think we've got three complaints outstanding um, that we'll just kind of go through one at a time, depending on how opposing counsel wants to do them. We can either just present all of our evidence in a row and then have them respond, or we can do complaint by complaint. And you'll see in front of you, you've got the complaint, and behind that is the sort of picture evidence that are stapled to the back of them. So I don't know if you have a preference about it. Oh, Mr. Fields, I thought you said the two were being continued due to uh, death in this month. And yes. Uh, so there's only one complaint we're dealing with today? Yeah, we're, well, I'm sorry, we're only dealing with the complaint uh, with, with the last part, uh, the National Animal Advocacy Against Southern Comfort. Okay. Uh, sure here with Mr. Blackman's farm. Three, three issues, then. thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, yes. Can I ask who's missing from the excessive perm or the operating without permits and the uh, unpermitted driver complaint? No, no, no. We're dealing with the complaints by National An Animal Advocacy. Right. Against there are three complaints. Powers. Yes. Okay. Sorry about yes. that. I thought you. I'm said sorry. It's one mat. One, one, one complaint and three complaints. Gotcha. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, one complaint, three sub complaints. Thank there you, sir. Yes. Um, I guess we'll just proceed through the through the three. So the first complaint that you've got in front of you is for, um, I think Southern Comfort operating eight carriages against four permits. So can you state your name and does she need to do her address and stuff? No, just your name, please. My name is Amy Pruitt. Okay, and were you at Opry Lawn Mills on the night of the 16th at 6.30 p.m.? Yes. Okay, what did you see while you were there? Um, Southern Comfort operating eight carriages. Okay, do you know how many carriage licenses Southern Comfort has? Four. Okay, how do you know that? Uh, through the communications at this meeting. Okay, and whose carriages were they? 
Um, they were Southern Comforts. One was American Mail Lease Carriage. Was that carriage leased to Southern Comfort at the time? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Per the decision of this commission last month, I think it was. Um, that's our first complaint. And I guess I can do, so these pictures here on pages, I guess they're not page number, but the next two pages after the complaint. Did you take these, this four and then these four? Yes. Okay. Did you take them on the same night? Yes. Okay. So these are the eight carriages that were operating against four permits? Correct. Okay. That's what we've got for the first complaint. Eight carriages operated Opry Land, one of them leased by leased from Melody American, American Melody. Melody. And you're saying he only has four permits? Correct. Okay. I, we'll go on to the second complaint, I guess, if unless you want to respond to that. I'm happy to respond to her. Sure. Uh, you know, what would be the most efficient way to get through this? I don't mean to cut you off, but what's the most efficient way? Maybe go through your complaints and then let them respond? That's fine with me. So we don't get cross-responding and everything? Okay. I don't know if I'm addressing that. Um, so, and then, I mean, you've got the ordinance listed for that complaint, 1254-20, 1254 right. requiring them to have a, you know, a one permit for each carriage that they're operating, which I think is four in the case of Southern Comfort. So the next complaint here um, involves an unpermitted driver. Um, so, Amy, were you there at, um, sorry, um, can you tell us in this picture who, who the driver is? That's the next page here in your... Um, James Fielder. Okay. Does James Fielder have a license to drive a mm, carriage? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, and can you tell me whose carriage he's driving in this picture? Southern Comfort. Okay. Can you tell me where the carriage is being driven? Opryland Hotel. Okay. So in summary, there's an unpermitted driver. Do you know who James Fielder is? What's his relationship to Southern Comfort? Um, I know that he, I believe he's um, a Southern Comfort driver's boyfriend. Okay. What's your basis of that he doesn't have a permit? Uh, from testimony at this meeting, I believe in September or October. What was it? Was he before the commission before? I think there was a like a confrontation incident? There was another um, uh, complaint that was brought uh, that he was involved with. And it was it was stated then that he did not, he w was not a part of the carriage industry. So does it appear to you that one of the carriage drivers stepped away from the carriage and had someone that she knew, possibly a boyfriend, drive the carriage for her? That's always a possibility. Okay. That's the second complaint. Um, third complaint here so again, you were there on the night of the 16th at 6:30. Yes. Okay. And did you take this picture, or excuse me, these are these are stills from the video. In the interest of time, we're not showing you the full 15-minute video of the carriage walking by. But these are stills from the video that you took. Yes. Okay. And you saw this horse personally as well. Correct. Okay. So on these pictures, the last two pages of the handouts in front of you, what's the, this along the legs and flanks of the horse here? Um, there was a lot of caked on dirt. And the, on the horse. Okay. Would you say that the horse looked unkempt in appearance? Yes. Okay. Would you say that it was properly cleaned? No. Okay. That's the third complaint. I apologize. What's your name again? Amy Pruitt. Amy Pruitt? Mm hmm Okay. Ms. Pruitt, are you, uh, if you don't mind me asking a couple questions, uh, are you employed by any horse carriage company? I am not. Okay. What was your interest in being out at uh, Opry Mills that evening? Uh, to go check out the horses and the carriages. On whose behalf? Nashville Animal Advocacy. You're a member of Natural Animal Advocacy. Correct. And, all right. <coughs> Thank you. Counsel, do you have any cross-examination or questions of Ms. Pruitt? I do have one question. Is it your goal to not yes, have Mr. any horse-drawn carriages in Nashville? Correct. So you're a biased witness in this matter? Um, I don't know. I think, you have an agenda. I, I think that any any person who files a complaint I, against the company is going to be a biased witness against that company. I'm going to, I don't know if we do objections here, but I'll object to that question. So, yeah, you can answer the question. Biased to... You have an agenda you wish to achieve, and you will take action to accomplish that, no matter what. Sure. Okay. Counselor, and, uh, you know, you, you just gave the example of one thing judges always say about lawyers. <laughs> Never trust one who says, just one question, Your Honor. I understand. I, and I wanted to just state my name for the record. I apologize. I started talking without doing that. My name is George Spanos. I'm here to represent Mr. Paul Morrison. What's your last name again? 
Spanos, S-P-A-N-O-S, and that's P as in Paul. Thank you, sir. Okay. Mr. Spanos, do you have some proof or argument or what? Uh, a little of both. If I could start with argument. Why don't we start with proof? Proof? Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Morrison, if you could just state your name for the record and your connection to the company. Paul Morrison, owner of Southern Comfort Carriage. You were asked about the number of permits you have. There was questions about the number of permits you have. Is this your application that you filed, or is this a compilation of applications you filed? Of the permits I filed. If I could pass this to you. Sure. May I approach? Yep. We're a little less formal than <laughs> may I approach, so. But I appreciate the. Uh, appreciate the confidence. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mr. Morrison, 2018 is on the top page. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Next to carriage, did you get 13? Uh, yes. Okay. Now, there's a restriction for downtown Nashville as to how many you can have riding at one time, correct? Correct. And how many is that? Four. Okay. Is the zone that they've outlined for Nashville, is that just the downtown area? Basically. Is Opryland encompassed in that zone? No. Okay. Is that why you buy 13 of these? Yeah. Okay. And you were, and this is the special events. And the when you were accused of having eight carriages instead of four, were you in downtown Nashville or out at Opryland? Um, Opryland? Okay, and and that's the next. That's part of my argument, uh, commissioners. Opryland is private. Before you go in the yes. argument, you got any proof on the other two complaints? Okay, I, I can address them all. You want yeah. proof on everything all at once? Yeah. I'm sorry. So. It might shorten your closing argument if it, you, it you may. get all the proof first. <laughs> Who do you use as a veterinarian, sir? Uh, Dr. Jones. Mr. Morrison, will you speak up, please, or get closer to the microphone? Uh, you stand here. I'm loud. <clears throat> the. The veterinarian is Dr. Dr. Jones. Jones. Okay. I have a few things I'd like to pass you on this. I'll give you a copy at the end. If that's okay. Counselor, are we dealing with the third complaint now? The muddy horse? We are in the third complaint. I apologize for skipping around, but I have the most on this to pass the house. And I'd like to start off with an affidavit for Dr. Jones. And while I'm doing this, I do have a question for Mr. Morrison to help speed up the process. Mr. Morrison, do you, uh, does Dr. Jones ever give you her horse to use in your carriages? Yes. Uh, two, uh, maybe three years in a row, she's let us use her horse. And we these get two this planes are several, years, several months in arrears. These all happened back in 2018, is that right? Two, yes. And that's why some of the dates on these documents go back to the beginning of the year and at the end of last year, is that right? Correct. And Dr. Jones provided us an affidavit and a letter as to the condition of your horses. Yes, sir. Do you take pride in keeping your horses clean and fit? Absolutely. Now, you saw the pictures. I just showed you those a minute ago in that compilation. Do you believe that there's caked on dirt or mud on those horse and that one horse that night? There was. Okay, and do you clean that off when it happens? Generally, we do. Okay, and did you clean that white horse that night? I don't know the horse's name. I'm not sorry. Not that. Not. No, sir. Okay, and why was that horse in commission that night? Well, this this has been the rainiest year we've ever had at Opryland. And we'd already began giving rides, and we had a horse that lost a shoe, so we had to take that horse back, and the rides have already started. We grabbed the white horse, Cinderella, brushed her off quick as we could, threw a harness on her, went back, and continued doing the rides. Okay. And... The horse that is in that picture's name is Cinderella? Correct. Thank you. 
Now, I'm going to show you the picture again, just so you're looking at it while I ask you. You see dirt below the knee. Is that the right term for the horse? Correct. Okay. And was it raining that night? Yes. So there was going to be dirt or mud one way or the other. Yes. And is this horse white? It's white. Okay. It's the hardest one to get clean. So you're going to see dirt or mud on this horse if it's muddy out no matter what, right? Correct. Okay. Was it on thick inches or is it just uh, around, have some on there? Down on the bottom around her, the feathers, feathers on her foot is pretty thick, but it wasn't thick all the way around. Is it possible to keep mud 100% off a horse when it's wet and raining outside? No, uh, it'd take a long time to clean it off. And that's why we get there early, so we can brush the horses and clean them. <coughs> but that was a, an ex, a situation we didn't plan on. And as far as the horse looking unkempt, it was raining that night? Correct. So is its appearance due to it being somewhat wet? Wet and muddy. Okay. That's not the general appearance of the horse, is it? No, absolutely okay. not. And I'd like to ask you on the second complaint, this picture of the driver. Who is that? He's another guy we're training. Uh, his name is James. His wife drives for us. And who was training him that night? Uh, Kenny trains the driver. And let me ask Kenny some questions. Kenny, can you come up and state your name? He was sworn in. Kenneth Hale. Mr. Hale, do you work for Mr. Morrison? I do. Okay. Were you training this gentleman on the evening in question? Yes, sir. Okay. And were you riding with him that evening? I was riding with him that evening, and uh, I get off the carriage, and I have to go get tickets. Okay. And on one occasion, did he think you waved him through to go before you got back on the carriage? Yes, sir. Was that a mistake? That was a mistake. Did you guys intend for him to ever be alone in that carriage? No, sir. It happened, though? Yes, sir. Okay. And you admit it happened one time that evening? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. But, to my regulation, yes, sir. Okay. But you were with him the rest of the evening? I was with him, yes, sir. Okay. Which is the protocol for this endeavor? Correct. Yes, correct. Mr. Hale, do you have an authorized permit to uh, operate a horse-drawn carriage? Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Morrison, was there anything else you wanted to address on these three complaints? No. Um I'm, I'm just surprised, you know. Mr. Morrison, yes, did you sir. obtain this affidavit from Dr. Uh, Jones? Yes. Okay. He asked me to assist with that. All right. Did you draw it up? I did. All right. And you were aware of the third complaint by that time, right? We were. And that's why this affidavit was drawn, correct? Yes. All right. And you identified the horse in the third complaint and the pictures to the attachment to the third complaint being Cinderella, correct? Is that a yes, Mr. Morris? Yes. Uh, okay. I don't see in the affidavit anything that addresses Cinderella. I see Ruth. Cinderella is the kind of carriage. I'm sorry. Say what? It's a type of carriage. What's the name of the horse? No, that. that he said it was Cinderella. the name of the horse. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Yeah. Excuse sorry, me. Sorry, Mr. Mr. I'll Fields, you take quiet. me right from my thunder there. I'll no. be quiet. All right, Mr. Mr. Morrison or uh, Counselor uh, Spanos. Yes, sir. Why doesn't the affidavit have anything to do with any other horse besides Dixie and Ruth? Cinderella's not even in there. I, 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 don't, I don't know if they're, they're saying, pertaining to the same two things. We did not have a picture of the horse in question I, when this was done. We were mistaken about the horse, which is why we subsequently got the January letter. Let me clarify. And you reminded me of that. It's been a while since I did this. Um, I apologize. That's why we, we didn't October have Cinderella in here. October 2018's when uh, yes. somebody signed it as a notary. Yes. And it had to do with some other issues that were going at that point. At one point, I think there were eight or nine complaints that we were to address. And we're here for three today. But the January letter was to encompass all the horses. January letter. Is that, I, the, that was the second item I yeah, passed you. Okay. Yeah. And I don't believe she specifically. Well, let me see what the date was on that third complaint. January 4th, 2019 was the third complaint. 
by National Animal Advocacy regarding Cinderella. That's and your right. affidavit's prepared back in October 2018. And as I said, this was for so some other issues sense. that had been pending mm -hmm. when we were here the first time, which was okay. prior to the turn of the year. All right. But in general, I'll tell you, instead of arguing, why don't you see if the commissioners have some other questions of, of the parties or the council, the lawyers for the parties, okay? I, I'm happy to, to argue after if we need it. All right. Anybody have any other questions, follow up questions? Uh, I know we have a horse expert on the commission now. So. <laughs> Ms. Pruitt, um, what, can you confirm was it raining that night? With the uh, it was not raining while I was there. I believe it had been raining earlier. And Mr. Fielder, James Fielder? He's not. Fielder. He's the one that is training. Married to somebody. Charlotte somebody that drives for me. How long has he been training? Well, uh, through Opryland. And uh, he used to help us downtown this summer by holding the horses while we'd go to the restroom or whatever. Um, when do we, do, do you remember, Ms. Pruitt, when that prior complaint was that you were mentioning where he stated he wasn't involved in the I believe carriage? it was from either the September or October TLC meeting. Yeah, where there was a dispute with uh, Johnny's driver about being too close or backing up and someone got off the street and some everybody videotaped each other or everybody cell phone taped each other. <laughs> That one, and there was another one yeah. where um, he was um, holding the, the head of the horse while the driver w had gone to the restroom. Okay. Yeah. What happened with those? Ma'am. Do you remember what, what the outcome of those were? I don't remember any argument. I, I remember they turned in a lot of complaints. A lot of them were on James for holding the horse. Most of them were dismissed. I mean, over the last eight months of 15 or 20 compliance. The bathroom one was definitely dismissed yes. because her defense was she had to go to the restroom so she handed the reins to see someone using the bathroom. Yeah, that's right. Just starting to see a pattern of people <coughs> saying one thing at a prior meeting and then another thing at the next meeting. So I'm wondering, is he in this industry or isn't he in the industry? Was, was he training with you back in? October or September? Was it? I'm sorry. When did when did Mr. Fielder start training with you? Well, he was with us throughout the summer downtown. I believe she's asking when he began training to oh, drive I'm a carriage. Oh, out at Opryland this year. Which so, was when? Uh, it started about the middle of November, 16th, I think. How long does training go? It did well, they can go through the whole time we're at Opryland because okay. it's a good opportunity, you know, it's private property, quiet streets, and no traffic. So is, has Mr. Fielder gone down and got a permit yet? No. Is yeah. he driving a carriage somewhere? No. What he, happened? He got another job uh, where he makes more money. What was he doing before he was training? You said he was with you, but not driving. Oh, uh, he'd help hold the horses downtown. Uh, if the driver had to go to the restroom or had to take a break, he would hold the horse with a lead rope. Was he an employee? No, he wasn't really an employee. He just came down, I think, a lot because his wife was working there. So just a volunteer? Volunteer. Kind of situation? Yes, ma'am. I have a question. A uh, person has four permits of working at Opry Lane. Is that a violation? It's my belief that you're allowed to have four carriages on the street at any time. It's been something I've argued in front of the commission. The commission's <laughs> aware of it. They're aware of it. The reason we do 13 in his case is to make it more convenient for them. Next year, we'll approve four. And that's all that'll be approved because mm -hmm. that's all you're allowed. Just, that's just what we'll have to do. Then if you want additional, you'll have to come and ask permission and we'll inspect it then. And we'll do that with all the companies. And that's not, I just, because obviously if it's, that's the way, I, and if the commission says that it's not, but you made a comment, 
in order to operate in Davidson County, it's very clear, the ordinance is very clear. It says no horse-drawn carriage company shall be used or operated for, on a for-hire basis by any person in the territorial jurisdiction of Metropolitan Nashville, Davidson County without an owner or operator first having obtained a certificate of convenience. It doesn't say private property, it says within the territory. We've been to court over that before and it's clear that it's territory. I, and, and it's clear that Opryland Land streets are, are public, they, public property. Actually, they're private. They are private, okay. But, you know, I mean, if, but to defense, if, if we've had this operation before, again, the companies for the most part are responsive to my request. I've not had problems with Mr. Morrison, and I'm, I don't have a problem with him today. Obviously, there were some issues going on that maybe I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And if the commission wants to change, in other words, we do allow, they can only have four downtown, but they can only have four out there, too. It's been the way I've always interpreted in my eight or nine years of being director of this commission. I could be misinterpreting that and or I could need additional uh, direction from the commission because if you want them to be able to operate other areas, I have no issues with that. As long as those carriages are inspected and as long as the horses are licensed and the uh, drivers are licensed. But obviously there was a, either a disconnect between me and the companies or, or something. And I mean, if I did it, I'll certainly take credit for mine. But we always do the carriages. I go to usually, I, I try to go to their place to make it convenient for them. Most of what I do in life is to be convenient for other people. <laughs> and I think they know that. And I think they would agree with that. We would. What I would point out with Opryland is, and this goes more to his mindset. He's not trying to intentionally break any rules. If it's interpreted differently by them, it's not an intentional act. What I would point out with Opryland is it's on a contract basis with Opryland where he gets paid. So it's not a person-to-person -person transaction, which is what I would consider a for-hire basis. It's a, he's not being hired each carriage ride. Opryland is saying, you come out, we're going to give you a percentage of whatever we make and what we collect on this. And I think that is a, a distinction in the regulation that you were just read by Mr. Fields. Maybe I'm interpreting it wrong, but if it says a for-hire basis, in Davidson County. I don't know that that's a for hire basis because Opryland is paying him to give carriage rides to people that come into Opryland and pay for them. I'm being a lawyer, I'm sorry. But that's what the language says. And there may be an argument there. And I think that what Mr. Fields just said is going to correct that in the future. But this is what had been done in the past and what was done at the time of this complaint being issued. Well, it sounds like for the last eight or nine years there's been a four carriage rule throughout the county. So it's not like they've went and pulled the rule over their eyes and it's always been the case that they could have 13 and this time they just forgot to ask. It sounds like Mr. Fields has always been pretty clear that you get four carriers in the county period. The document I passed up to you that showed how many he got last year will show you he's had more than four of varying numbers in past years if you go through the pages. Well, sure, he's allowed to have more carriages licensed in case one of them breaks down or something like that. That's the way it's explained to me. But it's four that you're allowed to have operating at one time. That's always been the rule. And for, on a four hire basis, well, let's not forget, it's a four for four carriages on a four hire basis. And this is a different situation. He's not downtown. Someone comes up and hires a carriage, that's four hire. It's on the spot. I'm paying you, Mr. Morrison, for your company. Opryland said, come here, bring carriages. We want this many, we're going to pay you to drive people around. I don't know that's for hire. It, would it be a violation for Opryland to, um, to have its own carriages and drivers that it, that it owned the carriages, owned the horses, and these were employees of Opryland to drive eight carriages? It, I don't think it would be because it wouldn't be on a for hire basis. Well, having a contractor, having an agent of your company do the same thing, you would analyze the same way under the statute. That's what Mr. Morrison was. He was an agent of Opryland. They asked for eight carriages. Instead of buying eight carriages, buying eight horses, and employing eight people to drive them, they had a contract with an agent to do that. Now, there's a distinction, and we're wrong. We're wrong. But I think there is ambiguity there in this scenario. It's a different situation than every other horse carriage operation, which you mainly see downtown Nashville although it could be other places. And again, we're talking about a four higher basis, and I don't think this was a four higher basis. And to Mr. Morrison's credit, he did go and get extra certificates to cover that. So he, he didn't have eight carriages and four certificates going at one time. He had 13 certificates, he had eight carriages that night. But he was employed, he was contracted with Opryland to do that. It's a distinction. I don't know that Mr. Fields likes that distinction. I, I don't know that there's been any litigation on that issue. I don't like or dislike any of that. I just regulate. I understand. I understand. All right. All right. All right. All right. 
We're getting late in the evening. I think yeah. everybody very clearly understands the distinction you're wanting to make. Um, Councilor, did you have anything else that yeah. you brought to complain? Well, you get the last word. Sure. Um, I think you've got uncontested, te uncontested testimony from not only Andy, but also from Morris that there was an unpermitted driver who was operating a carriage without supervision, whether it was intentional or unintentional or for a little while or for a long while. It's a clear violation of the statute under both witnesses' testimony. You've also got uncontested testimony from both parties that there was caked on dirt and mud and horse up to the planks, and that's also just a clear violation of the statute. You know, the, the defense apparently is that it was raining, cold, and muddy. Well, that sounds like exactly the condition you were trying to protect horses from in the first place by having it. You know, regulations like don't want to get caked on mud. Or so, from our perspective, that's at least two uncontested complaints. Um, and then the first one being a better day is an issue in the permits. I think, frankly, you know, I'd be hard pressed to believe that taking money from a company to drive carriages that carry passengers isn't operating carriage for hire. But that's more of nitpicking on the distinction without a difference. So, thank you. Ms. Pruitt, do you remember seeing um, Mr. Hale? Uh, I do not. How long were you there? I was there for about an hour and a half. How long were you observing Mr. Fielder? Uh, operating the carriage and give us a little more detail of what you actually observed him do. We see the picture here. Yeah, I did not take that photo. That was on a different night than I was there. Oh, really? Yeah. So the photo attached to the complaint wasn't, a, you didn't observe that particular incident? Correct. So what did you observe then? I observed the eight carriages and the uh, muddy horse. All right, so you're not giving any testimony to complaint number two. No, the... the um, I think her testimony to complaint number two is that she recognizes the individual. That, that picture is submitted okay. to us anonymously. Her testimony is that she knows the driver, she knows he's not permitted, she knows that's Aubrey Land because she's been there and she's seen it. He submitted a picture, didn't he? Beg your pardon? He submitted a picture, he didn't say, but you didn't say that you weren't there. Right, it was, it was sent to our organization uh, from someone who was out there. Do you remember his personal life? Um, her name was Jennifer. I don't remember her last name. The website for the NAA has a submit a picture function or submit a complaint. So if you see something you don't want to be a person to stand to be able to say, you can say kind of whistleblower style, they were doing this to the horses and that the horse, and here's the evidence. So I think the commission found a violation a couple of meetings ago back in November for a similar thing where there were the, the carriage had pulled in front of my hiring even, even though the witness hadn't taken the video because it was obvious from the video that the carriage was in front of the hydrant, they went ahead. Well, but I just don't know if we have enough evidence. I mean, we, we've got one witness here saying I was there. I stepped away for a minute. And we have nobody here to say I was standing there for X amount of time and I saw him operating the carriage. So that, that's where my sure. disconnect is I guess is there on is testimony one. admitting that they stepped away for a minute. So there was an unattended, unpermitted, trainee driver, you know, operating the Overland Mills. So even under that testimony, it's still a violation. The extent of the violation obviously goes to what the punishment is. But regardless, that's what happens. So I'm not sure. Mr. Fields, you've worked with Mr. Morrison and a number of these folks. What's your recommendation today? Come on, I'm throwing it to you. By far, the worst part of my job is when this happens. Clearly, I want to... I get accused quite often of trying to play both sides of the fence. And what I try to do is be empathetic and understand. I know Mr. Morrison is an honest man. If he tells me he really believed that operating those carriages out there was within his authority, I also actually asked, he didn't bring this up, but I asked the question. I said, were you ever given permission? He said, my predecessor, and he talked about this. And did not. And I said, did he put it in writing? He said, no. So I, he apparently has chosen not to introduce that or to, to give that, you know, so... You know, my, my position, unless the, my predecessor, and who was also my successor, because uh, I'm unique in this job from that standpoint, uh, if, if I typically affirmed every, if he did something, I affirmed it, because that's, you don't come in and, and change. I did not visit this issue with Mr. Morrison on the number of carriages at Opryland. The idea of, of, uh, of someone uh, being on the, on the carriage, they do have to train. Uh, by the same token, stepping away is, 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 is potentially serious. Had something happened, it would have been serious. And, and Kenny would say that without me calling him up in that testimony and so forth. I, I've worked with these people a long time. I th you know, I, I, think, I think, one, the commission should recognize there was at least an error on the driver's part. The horse, 
you're going to have your test, you know, the testimony of the horse was dirty. He, he agreed the horse was dirty. He cleaned the horse. Uh, so the, again, the carriages, you know, I believe you can only have four on the street. If, but I'm, I, I didn't see it. I didn't give him permission to be on the street, but I certainly did inspect each one of the carriages that he has. I personally inspected them. I personally handed and, and, and signed my name on them. So I can't question that those carriages were licensed by this body. Okay, thank you. Um, the way we usually proceed on this is we first uh, take a vote, or first see if there's a motion that there's been a violation of, and I think we better, we can take all three together or we can take them individually. And then if we do find that there's been a violation, then we uh, have a motion on what kind of sanction to impose. All right, so we're going to move along. Uh, you know, we really don't, have not had Mr. Morrissey up here for complaints of any major aspect, in it, you know, other than the back and forth that's been going on. We've certainly had all of them up here one way or the other the last year. And as I understand, some of them have got a truce flag up between them now. So, uh, uh, and I know you guys haven't yet, so. Unfortunately, we're the neutral third party. Yeah. <laughs> We'll see about that. But, uh, Mr. Morrison, have you had complaints before about your horses being dirty or unkempt? No, ma'am. This is the first time? Not that I recall of any. I don't recall any before of anybody. Uh, I mean, I mean, there's been complaints about the horses being underweight, mm -hmm. but um, I don't remember anything about being, being dirty at all. So. Anyway. It is a quarter till six, and we really have to be out here or we're locked in for the evening. So. I can't uh, think that fast. And, and that's not to minimize the complaints that have been brought by National a uh, right. Animal right. Advocacy. Right. Mm -hmm. So Bill, you thought on complaint number one with the comment that in your theory, they get 13 licenses, but they're only supposed to have an operation for it any time, and that's always been, no matter where in Davidson County, but your thought is that he had a conversation with the previous director that may have told him differently. And, and he had told me that. The, mo the, 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 mo the, close, the, the closest conversation that, you, that the commission's had mm -hmm. lately about carriages would have been an issue of pedal carriage, mm -hmm. a company that had one pedal carriage, but they had two carriages. Right. The commission's position was, you've got, you will license yeah, two, but you can only have one on at a time. And that has always been, we've had that same general rule, and I'm try, I'd have to go back and look at minutes when we would have done that on the carriages themselves, but. Well, I think at a certain point, we need to set some type of precedent that if that is the rule, then that's the rule. You know, I think he did act in good faith, is my personal impression. I don't think he intentionally did something wrong, but there clearly was a violation. So my thought is we would find that there was a violation, but I don't think there needs to be any disciplinary action, or at least very minimal. That's just my thought. I'm open to other things. Is that a motion on number one? <laughs> I'm happy for it to be a motion. Second. <laughs> Second? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Well, um, that's one. <laughs> let's go to number two. That is the uh, James Dilger. Un unsupervised, or I guess it really is a complaint of unsupervised. I think, as it's been pointed out, the evidence is extremely weak on there. Uh, we've got a picture. We don't know the circumstances of the picture. We've heard an explanation from well, then I would Mr. Make a motion Hill. To dismiss. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, um. You don't have to agree with this. <laughs> oh, I am fully aware of that. I'm just. <laughs> um, this is the this is Mr. Fielder, right? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't really like uh, all this. Attention on me. Um, can I ask him another question? <laughs> Which one? Mr. Hale? Yeah. Can you just um, 
what I guess what troubles me is you've been around for a long time. Even I know who you are, and I haven't been on this commission for a while. I know I know I don't know you in a bad way, but I know your name. Seventeen years. Seventeen years. Well, there you go. Um, so you were training this gentleman, you said, and you walked away. Well, I'm far. Okay. To I'll try to explain it to you the best I can. He's parked. So he's just sitting on the carriage. There's carriages in front of him. They go back going to work and I have to collect tickets and I'm on passengers on carriages. And then therefore then you get on the carriage and you go. So so he wasn't driving and there were no passengers in the carriage. No, no passengers. There was passengers in the carriage, I can see it on the picture. But he wasn't going anywhere. He's he's parked. So after you got the tickets, what'd you do? I get on the carriage and go with him. Okay. So he never drove it. He has pulled he off has twice. Pulled off. <laughs> He misunderstood. Well, you get an A for honesty. <laughs> I, I think his testimony know. was at one time when he was coming back, he thought, Mr. Hale thought he waved them off. Right, right, right. I, I remember. And that was where they admit that there was a mistake made, but it wasn't intentional. And he was actually going back to get on as he did the I rest mean, of the evening. I'm not going to, I'm, yeah. All right, I, I'll vote in favor of the motion. I appreciate the clarification. Yeah. All right, three over. Complaint number three, the uh, unkept horse. The unkept horse. Obvious there's dirt on the horse in the picture, so I think I would recommend that we vote that there was a violation of the horse being dirty. But again, I go back to you know, they had a horse that lost its shoe, they did attempt to clean it as best they could before they put it back into service. And again, if we want to you know, do a, a probation of a certain amount of time, you know, six months, that well, let's, let's vote on the uh, yeah. okay. for, all right, there's been a second. All in favor, all right. That's just, oh, there was a violation and the horse was dirty. Yeah. Okay. Three dozen. All right, we have a uh, complaint that, or violations have been found on complaint one and complaint three, open for discussion about um, sanctions. And we can do everything from simply give Mr. Morrissey a shot across the bow that these are violations and will not be tolerated again. We can do probation, we can revoke the permit, or we can. Um, do nothing. Do a suspended, you know, just suspended over his head for a period of time, which is sort of like unsupervised probation. Um, Mr. Morrison, my thought on this is, like, my primary concern on these is always with, with the horses and, of course, secondarily with the public image that they present. So I understand it was a rainy day. I have horses. I get it. So just... We haven't decided what we're going to do yet, but just keep keep just keep that in mind and do you know do the best you can. It sounds like you have in the past already, um, but hopefully we won't have you back here with another complaint about your horse being unkempt. Yes, ma'am. People are always watching and recording. Uh, that's apparently, true. in your business. Yes. I'm going to take a moment. I, I want to ask Nashville Animal Advocacy's representative here today. Can you come up a second? In the last six months, your organization has been uh, thrusting themselves into this foray of carriage, horse-drawn carriage disputes. Um, and often you come in with complaints, but you have no proof, no evidence, no veterinarian saying the horse is distressed or anything like that. Um, I got two things. One, I'd like to know what you think ought to happen today. and. Disbanding horse-drawn carriages in Nashville, Tennessee, is not on the not an option. Metro Council has decided that they can be in this community. They have been here, and, and I understand the agenda. My question is, what do you really think ought to happen here today? And then number two, I'd ask you to take back to your organization uh, to start giving some forethought before filing complaints. You're not going to drive the industry out of the community. But you are making us aware of some of the concerns about horses being employed to draw to pull carriages. So what what today? So I think that that is step one. I think that step one is drawing attention to horses that are working in muddy, rainy conditions with dirt caked all over them. You know, we're being operated by people who don't have licenses and are still trainees. 
Um, we know that this commission doesn't have the authority to just ban horse carriages outright without approval of the council. That's not our goal, at least not at this point. Um, I will also remind you all that I'm just counsel for NAA, so I'll relay that message to NAA. I will say that in my role as counsel for NAA, I personally withdrew five of the complaints that were pending before this commission because of the same evidentiary concerns that you had. You know, these, this is a small grassroots animal organization that just tries to enforce the rights of animals in Nashville and keep them safe. You know, they're not familiar with the ins and outs of the evidentiary rules. So when I sat down with them a couple weeks ago and we looked through these eight complaints, I said, look, you know, complaints five, six, seven, and eight, I don't think you've got the evidence for it. This is hearsay, this is that, this is the other. The only reason we proceeded with complaint two today was because of the precedent that this commission set, you know, where if it's a clear violation on camera, you know, so in this case, a, a guy sitting on a horse-drawn carriage without a trainer, you know, you would allow it. We'll be more mindful of that particular issue in the future, but I think that the NAA has made a pretty good faith effort already to, to cut down on its on its complaints, one, by retaining an attorney, and two, by having that attorney kind of call out the complaints that don't have as much merit as some of the other ones. So what do you want to see today? Uh, today, I think that the fact, I mean, there were two violations, right? Um, I think that the commission has the power to at least put the organization on probation, um, given that this is the first violation and there's nothing else going on. That seems like the natural first step in the progression. Thank you, sir. Open for discussion. So is probation different than what was the other term? Suspended. Suspended, Suspended. okay. Pro yeah. Two suggestions for they can see there are five things. You could do nothing, you could reprimand them, you could you could probate, put them on probation, you could suspend them, and you could revoke. Maybe. Suspension would mean they're not in business for specific. Correct. Correct. Okay. I'll move for probation for three months. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Oh, um, yeah. at least among those who have read the minutes. Um, I think that's still just you and me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so, I, I'll vote. I, I, done I, it. I, I can't vote. Okay, well, so, I make a motion that we approve the minutes from last meeting. And those who have read them and uh, have reviewed. <laughs> can you make your own second? <laughs> I'll second. Yeah. All right. And all in favor? All in favor? Aye. All right. All right. Motion passes to approve the minutes. Um, that's now, <laughs> is there a motion to adjourn? Yes. So moved. Yes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're done. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit Nashville.gov.